and welcome to the April 19th, 2023 school board meeting. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, are there any changes, review, revision to the agenda for tonight? Just a couple of links have been livened up and we should have marked those in red for you. They are. They are marked, okay. Um, any questions? And Madam Chairman, we'll need to take a motion for remote participation this evening. Yes, we will. Is there a motion to allow Mr. Cutter, who is, Andrew, can you please confirm you're alone and, and go through the, the necessary questions? <laughs> Yeah, sure. I'm, uh, I'm away on uh, business travel and uh, and certainly by myself this evening. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, is there a motion for him to be able to participate remotely? So moved. Second? That's, yes. All those in favor, please say aye. Oh, we're going to have to do roll call because Andrew's not here. So every vote tonight will be roll call. So Peter? Aye. Heidi? Aye. Liz? Aye. And then uh, for tonight, Ms. Harrison is not feeling well, um, but if she is able to, she will join remotely. Um, if she can, if she can. Um, so all votes tonight will be roll call. Remind me because I might out of habit not do that and I wanna make sure we do it all right. Um, all right, Andrew, you're all set to participate. Can you hear okay? I sure can, thank you. Good, okay. Um, consent agenda, is there anything anyone would like to move off of the consent agenda or all these items agreeable? Seeing. Just to confirm, Madam Chairman, is everyone able to access the budget committee link that was livened up? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, so moving on into summary of non-public actions from March 22nd, 2023. Ms. Harrison made a motion to accept the non-public minutes from March 8th. Mr. Cut Cutter seconded the motion. The motion passed 4-0-1. Mr. Plansky abstained. Ms. Harrison made a motion to seal the non-public meeting minutes from March 8th. Ms. McDonald seconded. The motion passed 3-2-0. Uh, on March 22nd, 2023, Mr. Cutter made a motion to accept the non why is this there? Oh, no. For March 22nd, Mr. Polanski seconded the motion and the motion passed 500. Uh, Mr. Cutter motioned to approve the nomination of Dana Giampala as CHS assistant principal. Ms. Ames seconded the motion and the motion passed 500. Mr. Cutter motioned to approve the nominations of Arian, I hope I don't butcher these names, Arian Goslin as CHS special education teacher. Ms. McDonald seconded the motion and the motion passed 5-0-0. Ms. Harrison motioned to approve the resignations as presented. Ms. Ames seconded the motion, the motion passed 5-0-0. These resignations included Katie Sheffer, the LMS school psychologist, Lauren West, the GMS special education case manager, and Nicholas Sika Jr., CHS social studies teacher. Moving on to our student representative report. Emma, you have anything to talk to us about? Yeah, um, so on Saturday, April 8th, Dr. J Dr. Jetty and I went to the regional student school board rep meeting. Um, I was able to hear from other student reps in our area about their roles. And we also talked about just some things and issues going on in different districts. Uh, I gained some helpful knowledge. That would definitely help me um, guide and prepare the new student reps we're electing in May. Uh, and this was definitely the first meeting for student reps ever held, and I thought it was a great event, and I hope they do it in the future. Um, student council also on that same day went to the Manchester Food Bank and helped out with um, food distribution. Uh, it was a great event. They really enjoyed it. And sports are up and running and off to a good start. I drove by Campbell. The boys lacrosse is having a game tonight. And the girls lacrosse and softball so also have a game tonight. That's pretty much it. Wonderful. And there is a lovely photo that oh, was yeah. on the agenda. Um, yeah. If I think the public can access it. It's definitely worth a look. Um, we'll move on to presentations and recognitions um, for tonight. The first presentation is of the New Hampshire School Board Association Scholarship to our very own Michael McDonald by Barrett Christina, Executive Director of the NHSBA. Um, also attached is uh, Mr. McDonald's winning essay. And so that is a link in the agenda for folks. Welcome, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. And 
Wonderful. Uh, uh, good evening to the Litchfield School Board. Thank you for inviting me down. Mike, always good to see you again. Um, I'm pleased to um, uh, be here to uh, the, the absolute best part of my job, as everybody knows, present um, a scholarship uh, to this young, young, wonderful young man who's, who's sitting next to me, uh, Michael McDonald. Uh, the New Hampshire School Boards Association is proud to offer a yearly scholarship program designed to encourage and support students who have a strong interest in pursuing a career in public education or related field. The scholarship is available to the children or grandchildren of school board members and whose school board is a current member of the New Hampshire School Boards Association. NHSBA provides five awards of $2,000 each in each of the five statewide regions. Factors considered for award winners are academic achievement, active participation in school-sponsored and extracurricular activities, community service activities, and an essay on the topic of steps that my local school board can take to promote student achievement. NHSBA is pleased to announce that the winner of the 2023 NHSBA Student Scholarship for the South Central Region is Litchfield resident and Campbell High School senior Michael McDonald. Michael is the son of Litchfield School Board member Elizabeth Liz McDonald. In addition to congratulating Michael, NHSBA would like to thank Liz for her service on the Litchfield School Board. Michael's academic accomplishments are numerous. He's maintained an outstanding grade point average while taking many rigorous high honors courses. Michael was named to the honor roll in all four years of high school and he is a member of the National Honor Society. In addition to being an excellent student, Michael was also engaged in numerous extracurricular and community-based activities. While at Campbell High School, Michael was elected class president, was a leader in the high school social studies honor society, and has coached youth, so has coached youth soccer, and is a member of the Diversity, Equality, and Engagement Program Club. Michael's references describe him as a young man who is analytical, approachable, and patient. He's genuine in his interactions with others and is always courteous and kind. He shows positivity, diligence, and humor in both his academics and co-curricular activities. It is clear that Michael is a young man of many accomplishments, is a wonderful representative of Litchfield and Campbell High School, and has a bright future ahead of him. NHSBA is pleased to congratulate Michael McDonald and provide him with the scholarship. Yeah, if you want us to read that now, absolutely. All right. Is it on? It's on. All right. A district's local school board plays a pivotal role in the academic development of their student body. The school board's decisions and actions will not only determine the future of the young men and women of the schools, but also the future of the nation, which is why it is extremely important that the, bo uh, <clears throat> that the board takes certain steps to promote student achievement and excellence. The school board should set high expectations and goals for its stu superintendent, staff, and students. Expectations and goals should include meeting with the needs of all learners, creating a safe environment for students, physically and emotionally, high academic rigor, transparency, and open communication with all stakeholders. Creating high expectations for district learners and staff helps students reach their full potential. Each student is unique, and it is necessary that there is educated and experienced staff to help learners become the best that they can be while still recognizing students may have their own pathway to success. Whether it be through vocational programs, music, arts, sports, college, or the workforce, students should have the choice as which paths to follow. Programs and staff must be in place to meet the diverse needs of district students. The board should continually assess the, these goals and to foster a positive learning climate where students can thrive. Open communication and transparency is also part of how the school board can promote student achievement. Parents, students, educators, and administration should all have a voice in the education of the town's children. Keeping parents informed of the new grading practices, policies, and any inf important information that may affect their children is key in promoting trust. Our school board just had a parents' night explaining competency grading to the parents in the town community. It was well attended, and the students' parents were thankful for the forum and asked many questions. Keeping the community informed through town meetings, emails, social media, school board meetings, and pre um, presentations is very important. A school's budget is voted on every year, and having all stakeholders informed as to what is happening in the schools is a good bit way to build trust within a community. In our politically polarized country, mem members of uh, committees across the nation, including many local school boards, have, been have, <clears throat> have become increasingly hostile to people who may not share the same views. The school board needs to work together and compromise on issues to operate a level at what the students deserve. Arguments can be helpful in understanding others' viewpoints, but when angry disagreements become overwhelming, it severely hinders any committee's ability to make positive decisions. The local school board plays a tremendously crucial role in promoting students' achievement. 
by setting high expectations and goals for learners and staff, creating a safe learning environment, meeting the needs of all students, and promoting open communication with stakeholders, the board can create a positive environment for the students to learn and grow. The board needs to work together and compromise on issues to provide the best education possible for their students. Ultimately, the success of the students will be a reflection of the efforts put forth by the school board. By, pri pri <clears throat> by prioritizing the needs of their students, the board can create a better future for the community and the nation as a whole. Absolutely. Thank you very much again to the hey, Litchfield School Board. Um, Michael, have a, a, a certificate here for you. The check is attached to the back, so um, give that to mom or dad. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to do a picture. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Michael, we're going to take a picture. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> We also have dad and brother here. I think dad and Tommy should get in one. I want to put my phone in the middle. I wasn't dressed for this. Just a quick shout out. Congratulations. No. <laughs> Which is why he's putting you in the back. Right. Uh -huh. Ready? I'm sorry. I'm sitting in the back. Do this one first. And okay. I don't know what we're going to use out of this. But ready here? Smiling. One, two, three. And then Heidi, you want to join in? Come with you behind us. Hide behind us. Are they what? The tissues and the... I can't see. That's what it doesn't matter. Yeah. Just, we got Pat Jewett, though. That's it. <laughs> and then uh, family joined? As it should be. Take the hat off, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Excellent smiling. Oh. And do you want any others? That's good. Right. Okay. So right. I will get those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Barrett, for coming in. And thank you to the student rep for, for coming to the yeah. meeting last week. That was a wonderful, wonderful Yeah, day. I had a great time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 6.30. See ya. Thank you. Tiger it. Hey, thank you. It's good. Wonderful. Yeah. Sorry, that tore off our time. No, we are good. I, that was good. That's important. How that often do we get to do positive things, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and moving on, we have a report from Jen Grantham, our principal of LMS. I will um, take a seat next to um, these fantastic teachers that are here to present this evening. Um, I brought with me Shay Bishop. Um, who is one of our seventh grade teachers, math teacher extraordinaire, and girls lacrosse coach extraordinaire. Um, she has taken on that wonderful uh, new opportunity in the middle school this year. And also Carrie Momney is with us. She's our seventh grade language arts teacher, um, our track coach, and exciting news for Carrie is she is taking off this weekend to run the London Marathon. Oh, wow. Ooh, exciting. Oh, very yeah. exciting. <laughs> She has a Boston Marathon, Germany Marathon, and New York, just Chicago. So proud of her, and can't wait to be following her path on the as she runs. It's such a good motivation for students. Yeah. But they're here to talk a little bit about um, both iReady and how it's being implemented at LMS through Beth. Um, so I'm going to get turn it over to these All right. more than qualified ladies, and if you have any questions, I'm right behind them for that. Thank you very much. So um, we kind of wanted, we, we snuck in a little double whammy here. We also, um, we're going to demonstrate our technology. If you're interested in seeing how the kids join uh, our classes, you can um, search hellosmart.com and join with this class code. And then whatever we're presenting, you'll see on your screen. And you'll get to answer the question. There is a question to answer, like we send to the kids. So. Andrew, can you see the screen? Sorry, couldn't get up mute fast enough. Uh, no, I'm not able to see. Let me turn the. Uh, yeah. If you're not able to make it work, I can listen in. No problem. Are Are you also on you following the TV? If he goes to hellosmart.com, it will show up. I'm on not following the TV. Okay, um, hellosmart.com and join as a student. And join as a student. And I have a class. All right, I'll check it out. Thank you. Oh, we got a few in there. couple students in there too maybe I'll remove them real quick <laughs> <laughs> might be Andrew are they are working they on it now I'm guessing uh, not yet I'm still logging in that's right though <laughs> that's better. yeah how do they see the class code the kids it's the same class code they're oh, in yeah. Got it. we have people crashing math class all the time believe it or not that's great yeah <laughs> 
All right, we'll go ahead and uh, get going here. So, and like I said, this is just so, can you guys see it on your screen as well? Those of you who have joined? Okay. Um, the cool, like if, if I were to write and demonstrate uh, what we're doing in class, so not only is it on my smart board, uh, but then it's right in front of the kids as well. So it's just kind of an extra, extra layer of them being able to see. So um, yeah, I know you guys know iReady a little bit. So iReady is an online program for math and reading. Um, Carrie's going to talk to the bullet points for my path. Um, so basically, in three times a year, students take a diagnostic um, benchmark assessment in both reading and math, which um, it kind of places them at a grade level um, based on their skills in a variety of strands in both reading and math. So for example, in reading, there are literature strands, vocabulary, um, as well as the the phonics, the high frequency words, um, and phonological awareness, which are the lower grades. Um, but based on those lessons, I already um, produces uh, individualized lessons to target um, specific areas of need um, for each child. Um, so if a student is below grade level in a particular area, the lessons will be targeted to that area. Um, if a student is on grade, on grade level across the board, the lessons generate on grade level material. Um, and if they're above grade level, um, the lessons are above. So it's highly differentiated. Um, the lessons are designed to meet those individual needs. Um, so there are two tracks um, of lessons that can be used. The first one is my path. Those are the ones that are automatically generated um, based on those diagnostic assessments. Um, the nice piece of this is teachers can override a particular level. As we know, um, this is a single data point. There are um, many pieces of data that inform um, a child's progress. Um, so as a teacher, if we see that a child is placed somewhere and they're showing a lot of success at that level, we can um, override that and place them um, at, a level, at a level or a particular skill where we feel um, that they can succeed and progress. Yeah, and part of the adjusting them as well, um, the way iReady works, if they're, if they're low, say, in numbers and operations, and just let's just say it's integer rules, um, then it, and then they pass that, it bumps them up to the next level. Well, the next level might be fractions, and maybe they're good with fractions. So we can say, nope, you're good with that. We can bump you up. Okay, no, you're good with that. So um, just the way it works, it's nice to be able to adjust that. Yeah. Um, the teacher assigned do this so I don't forget what I want to talk about. So um, we can, as teachers, assign lessons grade-wide by class or by student. Um, and I teach leveled math classes, so I can do it by accelerated and regular math, which is great. Um, we, and, and we do that. I do it a lot. You know, We do that a lot for pre-teaching. We know what's coming up. We've got um, information on angles. We're going to be working on angles. So here's a quick lesson on that to pre-teach uh, uh, remediation and enrichment. Uh, and we've also been using it uh, during our best class. We pull kids in for tier two intervention. So um, say greatest common factor is what we're working on th that they need help on. Uh, we don't wanna keep kids in an intervention for six months or until the next round of testing. So we can assign something in iReady that allows them to test out of that tier two testing. So we're trying to circulate those kids like every two to three mm -hmm. weeks. Um, so to just fill in those gaps in learning yeah. as well um, to kind of yeah, we, bring them yeah, up to grade level. Exactly. And it exactly. gives immediate feedback too. That's something that is in real time as the kids are taking the test, they're getting that feedback, Yeah. right or wrong, up or down. Yeah, and just to clarify, we're not using iReady as the tier two. We're just using it as the test to out. Identify yeah, grouping. to identify and then to let them. That's a good way for them to test out. Do you guys have any questions on that? No, thank you. Okay. Um, and these are some bar graphs. I'll just talk to um, the math bar graph. So uh, we assign one lesson in math and one lesson in reading per week. And it can either be, sometimes it's a teacher assigned lesson, sometimes it's a my path lesson, but only one lesson a week. Um, and you can see the amount of time that students are spending per week on a math lesson. Um, and then the average lessons completed for math um, are, are uh, one, at, one a week, which is you know a good amount. We don't wanna you know, work on overkill here. Yeah. Yep. Um, in reading is the same. Um, the reading lessons tend to go by a little bit more quickly um, for whatever reason, the way they're designed. Um, so students will spend less time on that um, to complete their 
um, assigned single lesson for the week. Um, so in general, it's between t 10 and 29 minutes, um, which can easily be completed um, during a single best block with time left over. Yeah, and the math seems to be between 25 and 35 minutes. They tend to be a little bit longer. But that also shows, I know there's been some questions and wondering out there about how many times a week kids are doing iReady. And this shows an example, and it's across the board in regards to it's one lesson in math, one lesson in reading, directly targeted to their learning level. Um, and and it help. doesn't. And it doesn't have to be. I'm sorry to yep. interrupt, John. It doesn't have to be done in in uh, best class either. You know, mm -hmm. we they exactly. do it in other times, homework or uh, you know, time other downtimes. Um, and this, we're uh, we're really proud about this in seventh grade. So uh, we test the students tested at the beginning of the year, and then they tested mid year. I forget when it was January. January. Um, in math. Uh, the average growth was 100%. Um, they met their 100%, so their growth for the entire year they met in, in six months, um, which we were really happy with. We're a little happier about reading, I the guess. Reading but. <laughs> was, <laughs> got the green star. Um, I mean, reading was 195%. So a typical years, uh, a typical growth is one year of growth. Um, so students have, many students have already surpassed their one year growth or moving on to two and more years. Um, by January, we had seen some students who were one to two years below grade level creeping up and are now approaching grade level, um, which is incredible. Um, and I think the math and reading is a little bit different because they're, they're, the types of questions are different. but. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it's working. Um, and the kids, I think we have seen, are really invested. We made, um, we've made a conscious effort to conference with the students and um, make sure they're aware of their strengths and their needs and what the plan is to help move them forward. Um, we set goals in January um, so they were aware of what their year growth would look like. Um, and so they were invested in how they did. Um, and they also know that it, it's determining their instruction on those lessons as well, and they don't want to be stuck doing something that they, they know they don't really need. Um, so we have seen that investment grow this year, um, and the engagement with this program has really increased as well. And I think this also speaks to what, at the um, community forum that we had in um, March, I believe it was. I can't even remember when it was, but the community forum we had talking about rigor and talking about gaps in learning and where kids are having challenges and difficulties that we recognize post pandemic. I'm not blaming the pandemic on the challenges that we have, but we have to address the reality that we have students that are functioning below grade level. This is one of the avenues that we are taking actively as a school to help close those gaps and to help kids perform more on grade level. Absolutely. And it was really exciting to hear the kids in the hall after they finished and were, you know, excitedly saying, I met my goal or telling their sixth grade teachers, you know, it yeah. was it was very cool. Seventh graders don't get excited about <laughs> academic <laughs> testing very often. So So this is an example of um, like in math class, I would so if you guys are logged in, I'm gonna send you this question. So I would read it to the kids and you guys there's um, multiple answers here. So select all the ways that I ready can be used for su student success. So you guys can choose those. There are more than one. Let's see, I may have a student logged in here. Oh, looks like all you guys. Okay, so we're waiting for one. Oh, you have to. Hit the arrow, huh? And then submit, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, hit the arrow? There's an arrow on the Actually, top. Actually, once yeah. you select, it should, be, it should be enough. Are there four of you logged in? I think because there's multiple. I didn't log in. Do multiple? In. No. I think you have to. Yes, no? It. No. Done. Okay, well, we're not going to worry about that. <laughs> Let's okay. see how you answered and see how you did. Thanks for the tip. Okay, very good. All right, so two of us got it completely right. All of these <laughs> are our ways enrichment, pre teaching, remediation, and targeted practice. Oh, sorry, one person missed one. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, I do like to use it for pre teaching. Mm -hmm. So. All right, and that's me um, being super successful there. Look the, at you. Ah, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, okay. So this is just an example of um, a reading lesson question um, that students would see. This is a seventh grade level um, inferencing question. Um, and the students, there is a, a short passage, it's about a paragraph long, that goes along with this. And the students would read it, and then they would um, select the correct answer. Um, couple of features that I like about this is the audio feature um, that kind of enables that accommodation for students who may need it. Um, but also this graphic organizer is something that um, kind of mirrors some of the work that we do in class with the background knowledge, the evidence um, to lead to that inference. So um, it's not always a question answer format for these lessons. They are interactive. Um, and they do, you know, provide support for the students um, to work through as they as they learn. Yeah, we just wanted to give so you could see an example of yeah. the questions without it being too long. And then I took um, three questions um, from a assignment that is, and it's a little bit small, hard to read there. Um, just building questions. So how many acute angles are there in an acute triangle? Student would select three. Um, the next question, a uh, triangle is equilateral if blank sides are the same length, that would be all three. And then another question, just um, what kind of triangle is shown here? So this would be a right triangle, you know? So just the different types of questions, again, that we use for pre-teaching. So, and I think that is it. That's all we have. Do you guys have questions for us? Can you talk for just one minute quickly about how we um, adjusted best practice to help address students' needs and be able to remediate or extend learning for students? Sure. So um, we, I don't know. How, so we have four instructional days of that instructional, um, academic focused. Um, so Monday through Thursday, where students have the option to complete their iReady assignment for the week. Um, other students, like Monday is my day, each teacher has an assigned day where they can pull for a remediation group. So Mondays I pull um, a group, we're focusing on vocabulary right now. Um, I co-teach actually with the special ed teacher, that group, um, so we can target a variety of kiddos. Um, I pull on Wednesday, I also co-teach with that special special educator um, and it's targeted tier two you know instruction um, for other students um, who need enrichment um, our media specialist Ms. Provencal runs um, several book club groups um, that are student-led um, that we have kind of created and uh, we collaborate um, on those this year which is an awesome opportunity for those kids to um, do something a little bit more independently and a little more um, self-directed but still extend their learning um, in reading and I have the option for kids any of the days other than my remediation day to come with a buddy and try a math challenge problem and it's it's not work independently and you know blah 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 but you know come get some friends try to work through some some higher level problems together and then I can assist if you need it you know at some point you know so another nice option yeah and then yeah. I can do that in any of the classes that the kids have an interest in science has the same option mm -hmm. I know um, it's like nice enrichment What's that? It's like enrichment. It is enrichment. It is. Yeah, because not all the kids need, obviously, don't need remediation or, yeah. right, you know. And it gives us an opportunity to, to sit with a student one on one, which you don't always get to in at the chaos of a day sometimes. Um, so it gives you that opportunity for that one on one, um, whether it be enrichment, talking about a book, or providing um, extra support. Um, so it's. It's a very fluid block. Um, any given day, my students are, oh, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go here. Some days I have five students left after they've all dispersed to where they need to be. Um, other times, it's a more full group. So it is very, um, I'd say, student-directed um, and kind of individualized um, for those days, which is, I think, has been highly effective. Yeah, and then we us. use we are using Fridays as kind of a reward day. You've, you've got your two assignments done in iReady, like we've asked you to do. Um, here's here's some choice activities. Um, I tend towards the sport activities. <laughs> yeah, some um, student choice. Yeah, student um, choice. Enrichment. Enrichment. Well. Yeah. 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 Do the special ed students use this as well? Oh yeah. Or the special ed teacher uses it, and mm -hmm. his yeah. or her classroom. Excellent. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And again, we're doing a lot of that co-teaching collaboration mm -hmm. as well, um, which I think has been it's huge. Yeah, it's it this year, levels so. each child at their own level. It levelizes. It starts where they need. 
to be staring exactly that's what i'm looking for exactly yeah. Yeah. Which in my reading classroom i have students ranging right now from anywhere from first grade to 10th grade um, mm -hmm. in reading and that's a massive range to meet everyone's needs um, in a single period so um, yeah i ready is able to target those needs make sure everybody is getting you know what they personally need to progress even outstanding teachers like we have at lms and i have in front of me here the, the best you can do for differentiating in a classroom setting is, you know, I'm going to say two, three, maybe four different activities that you have ongoing at a time, but it's really like, um, think about whack-a-mole when you're trying to walk around and there's four mm -hmm. different activities. This allows you to differentiate if you have a class of 21, every student is working at their level. Every student is doing what they need, what they need directly for their own improvement and growth, whether it's acceleration, remediation, or on grade level activity. That brings us to the end of our iReady presentation. I know it's been a lot of questions, um, and I hope that this helps inform the public at home and the school board in regards to how we're leveraging this great tool um, that really helps teachers inform their practice and go forward. So thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Principal Grantham? On her report, is everybody good with that? Thanks. Um, the only thing that I really just wanted to talk about uh, in addition to what we just talked about um, is an amazing trip for our eighth graders. And again, I apologize for being in a hat in Disney where it was Disney Day for Spirit Week this week. So normally I wouldn't come to the school board dressed like this, but <laughs> you don't want to see the hat head, I promise. Um, so we had a fantastic trip with our eighth graders to um, Nature's Classroom um, back at the beginning of April. Kids had an outstanding time. There were smiles on all of their faces. Those of you that have children who went, um, it, was, it was just really an outstanding bonding experience for the kids who chose to go. And the kids who stayed back actually had fun as well. They did passion projects and they did um, have an opportunity to do some cooking with Spanish teachers, so it builds in our facts <laughs> minimum standards, and um, we, we were just we just had a really great opportunity to round out our, our eighth grade experience. So. Didn't the sixth graders used to go? They still do. They, they still, still, still do, do. but oh, they okay. do. This, this group of eighth graders missed it due to COVID. Oh, okay. So it was not a trip that they took. So it was a class that didn't have that opportunity that Mrs. Sidlow took with every student under the sun for 35 years. Mm -hmm. But they have different curriculum one science in the eighth grade was social studies for the nature's one, classroom nature's class so the nature's classroom w t trip whatever we that took um this time took a few of the things that they may have missed in sixth grade when they didn't go and then added more things that were more at eighth grade level they really awesome. differentiated um the teachers that you know, we had Mr. DeForney who had come and he'd gone with sixth grade in the past and he was like, wow, this was different because they had a little more independence because they're eighth graders. They weren't babying them. Um, but even some of the goofy things that they do as part of Nature's Classroom that is their mantra, the waitrons and the ORT report. I don't know if he came home singing the ORT report. Um, it, it just... It was great to see them be kids because they still are, even though they're eighth graders and getting ready to go off to high school and, and develop. It was great to see them playing with each other. It was great to see them problem solving. They had um, ropes courses that they did. It was, it was pretty, pretty awesome. I was really excited to see. And they have some programs that we're taking a look at for a possibility for next year um, that are truly designated to our eighth grade curriculum um, in perhaps some different campuses of nature's classroom to be able to have that overnight experience in a cost-effective and affordable way for families. Awesome. I'm hearing uh, eighth graders need to get their permission slips in, according to my son. Yes, they do. They have three more field trips coming up for the end of the yeah. year, like we did last year with the uh, what we called non-DC trips. <laughs> um, they are doing traveling New England again, where they're going to be going to uh, the Cog Railway. They're going to be going to um, Boston to the Freedom Trail and Faneuil Hall, and they'll also be going to the eighth grade tradition. Canopy Lake is open again this year at the end of the year, so they'll have that opportunity to revisit that. Nice. But they're still learning going on in all those places, <laughs> so just want to clarify, those are all learning field trips that they're going on. Mm -hmm. And fun. <laughs> Any questions? Nope. Nope. Awesome. Thank you Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. All right, and we will move on to community comment on agenda items. 
And we will close community <laughs> comment on agenda items. Um, thanks for participating or not. Um, correspondence. Oh, hold, please. Here we go. So, Peter, you sent an email today saying you were trying to figure out Google. My email stacks. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I miss things that come in later. So some of these I went through the whole thread, and some of them are spread out. So starting on... April 6th. Andrew Cutter sent us a, a message about budget committee highlights. Also on the 7th, Doug Totten discussing from going to from nine buses to eight bus, buses. Andrew Cutter believes we should consider cutting a bus due to declining enrollment, but be mindful of start times. Liz McDonald, I said we cut a bus route last year 345 is too late for GMS kids to be getting home CHS LMS pickup time has traditionally started at 640 Doug Totten shared the start and end times uh, start and end times of routes right now um, I mentioned I was at GMS today there are a lot of things going on with bus and one, one and seven and Mr. Mitchell chimed in that it has been happening for a while Mike Jetty will have an update tonight 4-7, Melissa Reiki commented on eight students leaving the district, leaving a big hole in the class. 4-7, Melissa Reiki thanking the school board for hiring another Spanish teacher, commented how lucky we were to have Jacqueline Ruby. Is it Ruby? Ruby. Ruby. 4-10, Jan Sullivan sent the school board minutes and updated minutes. 4-10, Mike Jetty to Patrick Keefe, a copy of the teacher riff letter, 24. Pat Keefe to Mike Jetty, thank you. 410, Andrew Cutter, draft budget committee meeting calendar. That was a mouthful. Uh, 410, Andrew, expectation of a draft budget timeline starting October 24th. Mike Jetty saying the district needs more time to develop oops, a budget. We do not need six meetings when we have done in the past or two or three. Andrew Cutter believes we need more meetings and the board does not want to go through the, the board does not go through the budget closely enough. Explain why the town needs more time. Again, 10-24 is the proposed date. Elizabeth McDonald to Andrew Cutter. I'm confused why we are discussing this in April. Adds Tina Harrison to the group chat. 410, Heidi Ames, discussion on budget committee budget sessions. We need to have discussions as a board. We have a very full fall with negotiations, which takes a significant amount of time from our school board members. 411, Emma Ducharme, district newsletter. Yay, Emma. 412, Crystal and Andy Foster is disappointed in the lack of diverse options for self-identification on gender questions. 413, Mike Jetty shares the school board agenda. 413, Doug Taunton, Capital Funds 30, Summary 20, 2019 through 23. 413, Tara and Bob Keating tell Ms. File, this is from last way, the last correspondence, that a meeting is not necessary, has four questions. Why is extended school year being cut? What are the plans for functional skills within the special ed program? What are her short, middle, and long-term goals of the special ed department? And where are we with the alternative diploma discussion? 414, Tara and Bob Keating asked for answers to be provided, and then they may want to set up a meeting. 413, Sophia Fowler would still like to meet in person. 414, Barbara Blansky sends the agenda for the 418 meeting. 414, Dr. Jetty responds to the Fosters, thanking them for their input. After hearty discussion, we had to balance community sentiments. We used traditional male-female, not listed, and prefer not to answer. 414, Mike Jetty saved the date for a presentation from Fred Bramanti. Bramanti, yeah. Bramanti on revisions of the educational 306 rules, uh, followed up with invitations to dinner and the forum. 414, Jan Sullivan sends a draft meeting minutes for 4 5. 416, Andrew Cutter will be remote 418, asks for a link to be added. 417, Ann sends a copy of a manifest. 417, Peter Polanski will not be available for May 17th due to a family obligation. Mike Jetty working with town to get 
the um, meeting broadcast, the whatever forum broadcasted. Heidi Ames is in agreement on moving regular meeting to the 24th. Sophia Fowler to the Keatings. There is no documented framework to determine the needs for each student. Three hours a day is an approximate half a school day. An extended school day was added. Extended school year has never been more than four days a week. Functional life skills are being discussed. Short-term goal is to get frameworks for each special ed setting, so there is a point of reference. Nothing has been written down to date. Date for independent diploma meeting was postponed due to a scheduling conflict. 419, Peter Plansky to Jan Sullivan asking for meeting minutes. 419, Jan Sullivan to Mike Jetty. Oh, that might have been Peter Plansky. Re respond, where to find the minutes. Ann Anamarati, 419, credit card manifest, 419, Peter Polanski asking if there are any budget changes, 419, Mike Jetty to Peter Polanski, changes are in red. Woo. And I stopped at 2.30, 3.30, sorry, if you wrote after 3.30. Call it a day. Thank you for reading those off. You're welcome. Um, They're moving. already sent to uh, Jan. Perfect. Moving on to general business, superintendent's report. All right, so uh, the LMS sign uh, have had ongoing communication with the town. Jeff Blackwell is looking at um, helping us to get a sign. There were a few different ways that we might proceed, but I think we are on the same page. So I'm going to keep the board up to date on that as we keep working on it, but we should be making headway on that quickly. Uh, the May meeting changes, I did provide a summary of the email communication. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important that the public know that we are moving that May 17th board meeting to the 24th, because that's a change in the normal routine. Um, and we're going to have that Ed 306 community forum at 630 in the Campbell uh, Auditorium. And I, I can't emphasize enough, uh, the state board is considering a revolutionary rewrite of the Ed 306 rules. This Which will, are? These are the rules that define public school as we know them. And so really, they're going on, on a, a statewide tour, listening to communities and receiving feedback on the rewrite. So as soon as I can get a presentation that summarizes the work that's being done, I'll get that shared with the community. Um, but I would ask as many people in the community who are able to turn out on Wednesday the 17th at 6.30 to hear from uh, Fred Bermonti, who is the lead on the project to rewrite those rules, because they will have a, a big impact on on what happens with public schools in New Hampshire. So staff involved, invited? Oh yeah, we're gonna invite staff, we're going to invite um, the public. And I, I suspect that the state board will make some of these dates public on their site. So we could have people from out of town coming. It's not just a Litchfield thing. It really is a, an opportunity for the state board to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, or the people doing the work for the state board to be heard. It's possible, I mean, the state board chair lives in Bedford, so mm. you know, he may show up. We don't know who, who is gonna come. Uh, the commissioner is not too far away either, so they may decide to show up at this meeting and to be a part of the community forum. So um, it's a big night, it's a big opportunity for us, and we wanna get as many people there as possible. And I think the other key point is the fact that it just happens to be um, a five Wednesday month, so we're able to push that next meeting to the 24th and mm -hmm. still manage to have two meetings in the month, have this forum, as well as um, not allow too much time in between and have too much of a gap between our meetings. Um, Either way, we're going to have a two-week gap somewhere. Somewhere, So now right. the two-week gap is filled with this community forum. So right. it's still, um, as I explained to Fred uh, when... I offered him the dates that were available, um, and he was booked. He's in Bow one night, and I can't remember where he was the other night. So, again, he's doing these across the state. But I said, people in Litchfield think of Wednesday night as school board night or school mm -hmm. meeting night. So if yeah. we can stick to Wednesday and not try to book a Monday or a Thursday, it would be better. So fortunate that we were able to make that work. Um, next is uh, impact fee update. So just wanted to update the board. Uh, as you remember, the board had authorized us to ask the select board to release the impact fees that they're holding um, toward the payment of the lease for um, the project at LMS. And so that request has been in front of the select board for quite a period of time. Um, following along with the meeting postings, uh, the select board sought legal advice from their attorney who said, yep, it's an allowable use. You can use 
the impact fee money that's been collected in order to uh, pay for a lease on a project that's improving the school for all students. Um, but the select board has not yet acted on that. They've, um, they have not taken a vote to release those funds. And my understanding from watching the last meeting is that they are asking their attorney to come and speak to them. So um, they're having a, a future meeting where they want the attorney to come and explain it. Um, even though our understanding is the attorney's already said it's allowed, it's an allowable use. So just wanted to kind of update the board on that situation. Um, we have not, um, we have not involved our legal side because, you know, it's, it's interesting that the attorney has said it's an allowable use, um, but it hasn't been released. I don't want to cause the town to pay double attorney fees by having our attorney talk to their attorney. Um, but I, I think it's important that the board just be aware that, that this How is still ongoing. How much money are we going. talking about? Doug? It's uh, we $52,148. And, and remember, those are, um, those are dollars that were collected from developers that were probably passed along to the people who ultimately bought the property that was developed. Um, and the purpose of those fees are that by building a new house in town, there's an impact typically on the school, typically on the community. So they collect fees in various buckets. And one of the buckets is the educational bucket. Um, and so it's used to make the kinds of improvements that the community can benefit from. So um, there's nothing extraordinary about the request here. We're improving a middle school that's 40 plus years old and was in need of renovations. Um, and we're not using taxpayer dollars because here's $50,000 worth of fees that were collected that can go toward that um, and can avoid uh, having taxpayers. Am I recalling correctly that there was a request from someone else in town, not the school, to use impact fees so in a similar the, way? They're building the pickleball courts with some of the impact fees. I know that. Well, they're paying, uh, my understanding is they're paying for the fire rescue building, their payments with impact fees. Right. So that was kind of like, once we found out that, we're like, oh, that seems like a great use of town impact fees. Why don't we do the same thing with the municipal lease money, uh, our municipal lease payment for the middle school as well. So that's where we got our mm. idea yeah, from. Yeah, right. So the select board approved it for the fire department paying of the building, but they haven't approved it for our renovation project yet. Is that correct? That, that that's, correct? that's our understanding. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is there anything we can do on that? Uh, I mean, at this point, you know, the other piece is with the fiscal year coming to a close, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're almost at April vacation next week. We are at April vacation next week, and then we're back into May, and you really have May and June, and then we have to close everything up. So, you know, having a resolution of this before uh, the fiscal year closes makes sense to us because this would allow us to apply that toward the lease. Um, we've already made the lease payment because the lease payment was due. So we have made the lease payment, um, but this would be uh, a way to help um, help to close everything out in, in a good situation. So that's why we're kind of raising it tonight and just want the board to be aware the check is not in hand yet. And yeah. there seems to be an ongoing dialogue with the select board. Well, my hope is we have, through email correspondence, and I think Liz alluded to some of it, tried to start to set up those chair meetings between the chair of the budget committee and the vice chair, chair of the school board and the vice chair and the chair of the select board and the vice chair. Um, budget committee's on board and ready to have those meetings, and we've said so, but we haven't heard from the town yet. But this could be a good topic to discuss in one of those meetings to be able to hopefully find a resolution yeah and as far as anything else we can do um, so we were asked to provide some information back in January January when we made the request um, which was good because you know they, they had their lawyer look into it and they wanted the uh, schedule of payments and then we also shared with them the, the budget because one of their concerns is that we're double dipping we're asked the town people for this money and then we're gonna use impact fees so but the the budgeted amount for this year towards the, the payment was not the full amount um, so there's a hundred and sixty eight thousand dollar difference between what was budgeted for and what the payment is so what's budgeted for you know again everyone always has access to that that's mm -hmm. on the district webpage um, and so there's there's a, a difference which we have to make up so it's not 
it's not kind of double dipping for that. I, I think that's a point to punctuate that mm -hmm. we budgeted 195. 195. 195, but the payment was 360. So we didn't budget the full amount. Now that was supposed to be covered by cost savings with the project, but of course as the project ran long and the heating season um, wasn't right. able to be covered by the project, right. you know, these funds are useful because it's not budgeted, right? right? So that's, that's a really key thing to punctuate because um, I know I, I had heard a comment was made that um, the school district budgeted for that versus the town had planned to use the impact fees. So the difference is the town had planned impact fees for the uh, fire station, but the school had budgeted for their project. Well, not really. We budgeted a portion, but not all of it. So um, it's not like we're replacing budget funds to use them in some other way. The impact fees are helpful toward uh, making the payment. There may be a lesson there that we budget what it is, and if there's savings, then it's a bonus, rather than say it's going to be 195 when it's really going to be 365. Mm -hmm. So this year coming up, it's budgeted for the full amount. Right. Correct. So next fiscal year. I'm going to add it to my list to follow up on that communication because I'd like to get that meeting set up for May because I feel like these types of conversations I think would be helpful um, to be able to answer questions and yeah so I'm adding it to my list and, and it may be helpful to um, just track if the attorney is going to meet with the select board their attorneys mm. and meet with them okay. um, maybe we want somebody to attend also to yeah. answer questions because we've got to get this brought to closure because sure. um, I didn't realize we started this in January yep so it's been ongoing yeah okay and it again it's going to help all the taxpayers by utilizing sure. these funds. School calendar? Yeah, so school calendar, the school board approved this and everything was good to go. And then the high school came forward because on Friday, oh, now I got myself goofed up. Friday, May 12th, the, count, the current calendar says that it's the early release date for senior projects. And the high school came to me on when, or no, Monday and said, Hey, it's always been on Thursday. When did it get moved to Friday? I'm like, it's on the calendar for Friday. I'm not sure. Um, so we look back. We're not sure how it got marked as currently being on Friday, but we are resetting it back to Thursday because um, that's the traditional date. And then they present to classes on Friday, the morning after. So um, students get to hear the, the senior projects on that day. So that raised the point of this year's calendar where um, again, it was marked for a Friday. So I'm coming to you to, and I don't know if you want to revote or if you're okay with this because it's conceptually the same thing, um, that it would be on uh, Thursday, May 9th and not Friday, May 10th um, because the, the high school wants it on a Thursday. So same concept, nothing else about the calendar has changed. You already approved this on March 8th, um, but now we're this is an update because we're proposing to move it from the 10th to the 9th unless somebody has an objection to it so just to clarify oh, this no is objections from my side however i do see that in the description it says early release chs grades i guess that's grades 9 10 and 11 and not the dates 9 10th and 11 correct that's correct grades 9 10 11. all right it's right, and, and it. the Thank seniors you. stay for the day to do their presentation yeah is it correct for this year? So we don't need to vote on, am I, this is just this for the 2023, 2024? It's definitely it, May 12th this year. It, and it's, they're going to, they're going to send notice out that it is moved to the 11th. It'll be oh. on, it'll be on Thursday. Lucky. So it, okay. we're really making corrections to two calendars. Two calendars. Because oh. it, it wasn't supposed to be on Friday. Um, okay. Because that's the number we've heard all year. And Jake, I, I said you can absolutely make that, but it's your responsibility to communicate to everybody that it's now on the 11th. The other problem was, because um, it's always on a Thursday, so the athletic director protected that Thursday with games. games. There are four games on Friday the 12th. Oh. So he <laughs> said, I can't do it Friday night. Yeah. Um, you have all these games. I'm like, yep, get it. We got to air on the, you know, getting the right date for kids and families, which is Thursday the 11th this year and Thursday the 9th next year. Okay. Important. 
Does anyone feel like we need to vote on this or are we fine with it being the concept is the same, it's a minor tweak that we don't need to approve the change? Any strong opinions either way? No. Nope. Are we safe just to do to yeah. approve okay. it? Make it? I'll make a motion yeah, to let's just, I'll make a motion to approve the calendar. Second. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Peter? Aye. Liz? Aye. Andrew? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So that passes for zero zero. And, and I'm going to take that motion was to adjust both calendars because yeah. you seemed okay with yes. both yes. adjustments. Okay, yeah, perfect. No Thank issue. you for that. Um, and then one last thing, I just wanted to briefly talk about the school climate surveys. So um, the student surveys opened up today. Um, actually, Emma, I'll, do you mind speaking to it for a second? You did the surveys at the high school yeah, today? Yeah, we did a survey during advisory today. Um, they're just kind of asking us some questions about the climate and how things are going in the school and things that we like about the school and things that we think should change and stuff like that. Did they show the video in advance from the students? Yeah, I got the video, I think, earlier this week, so I was able to look at it beforehand. So each school filmed a video with students asking their peers to take the survey seriously. So it's the steering committee students who, who basically said to their peers, this is really important to us, right? Mm -hmm. And so that video went out in advance. We didn't share that with the families because it was really students talking to their peers. Um, and then I sent email links today out to all three schools. So everybody in the community should have gotten those links. Um, and I would just, add, I know we're like surveying people to death at the moment, but please take this survey because um, it's really important to the schools and the student work. Yeah. They need the data from families. Um, there's a separate survey that went to staff and then the student surveys themselves. So, um, parent survey. We did the parent. Yep. I did the parent survey. The parent survey. So, so is the survey for something we do for the state or is it just something we're doing on our own? So last year we talked about the school climate and culture and we found uh, Bill Preble who is a professor at New England College but also runs the Center for School Climate and Learning and Bill had a survey that was already done. It's called the Safe Measures Survey. He's done it with probably a million people across the U.S. He's been contracted by Los Angeles School District to go in and do the survey. So um, we thought taking a tool that was already vetted and tested and hiring people who have experience administering and interpreting that made sense um, <laughs> we entered into a contract with Bill to do that survey so that's the survey that went out today okay any other questions anything else that you wanted to add to your report no thank you for asking I think that that covers it thank okay. you Moving on to a uh, financial and operation report, business report. It is the second meeting of the month, so we get a, more details. All right. Yeah, so LMS renovation, definitely the calm before the storm happens again on June 19th. They're coming back to renovate the kitchen and finish tying in the HVAC work in the cafeteria as well. Uh, so we see the March invoice is smaller than, than typical because there was less work being done at that time. Uh, financial reports, there was a request. Hey, 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 Doug, just a question on the app. Yep. Sorry, quick question on the LMS renovations, right? And apologies for interruptions. Um, will they be re replacing the ceiling tiles in the, in the kitchen area as well and, and where everyone seats? Yes. Like the ceiling panels? Yep. Next. Thank you. You're welcome. Actually, yeah, because they, they've done the entire school, Andrew, other than the calf in the kitchen. So yeah. that will be all tied up and every tile in the building will have been uh, replaced as part of this. Great, and the lighting is a part of that too because I know they haven't done that quite yet. Correct, yep. so those lights are in one of the Connex boxes out back and that'll all be done in the summer. And then part of the summer Thank work you. too is regrading, adding some loam and reseeding around the building as well. Uh, they pulled out all their their equipment, um, but if as parents are driving around the, the back of LMS, that back right side is, is still just more of a mess. Um, so they're coming back to take care of that as well. So the old oil tank will come up they're first. Taking care of the tank and yep. yeah, okay. yeah, the oil tank will come up first and then they'll regrade loam and reseed and, and water. Um, so which which will be good. So financial reports, those are what come out every month. There was a 
an ask to have the reserve and trust fund balances be shown by, by month. So what I did was, if you click on the financial board reports, um, I added ta uh, tabs at the bottom. So you could go into reserve and trust balances mm -hmm. and you can see the balances per month. I'll add in July through December. I'm working with the, the town trustee to get access to um, their spreadsheets as well. But those will be added in and every month you'll be able to see. For the most part, you can see it's just interest that's gone up between January and March. Um, and then the next tab over is just the purpose of each fund because it used to be reported with a purpose. So that's there as well. So any questions on the March financials? All right, so for several months, people uh, have been wanting to kind of, if we look at Fund 30, the Capital Projects Fund, kind of how does that look, not just for, for last year, which there's been multiple presentations on, but just kind of looking at over multiple years for that. Um, so I went back and I compiled that, and what I did was try to put some summary sheets as the first tab, so people can kind of see the expenses per year, by location, um, by vendor, and then as well as the revenue. So one thing that, that people notice that, you know, 2019, their, the expenses were 445,000. They were tracking the kindergarten as they went to full day kindergarten, and then the work that was done at the front of GMS to more secure that. 2020 was $0 spent in the capital. Uh, projects fund and so what I really did for a lot of the summaries was the 21 through 23 because I believe that's what people were more interested in that the work at LMS what ended up being more of that total amount so we are not again at the total amount because we these are expenses as of April 11th we are you know we still have um, North Branch work that will be happening this summer as well as the architects that, that are part of that as well. I didn't put projections into this. Uh, I wanted to kind of, it's, it's a summary of actual expenses. So there's also a tab on revenue and then as you move over, there's tabs of per year for expenses kind of grouping it by location as well as ones that group it by vendor. So Doug, what's the $222,000 for a district? So $222,000, so if you went to the fiscal year 23 expenses tab, yep. you can see that for, for this year, we have paid DDH Energy some money for consulting. So that's on um, energy as well as the IRA work seed grant. So he, he, he's been instrumental in bringing in grants um, to the district, so how they did the lighting, 80,000 of that came from the seed grant, and you know he applied for the seed grant for the district, is my understanding, mm -hmm. and you know so and has also been consulting in regards to to solar, how to kind of make sure a building is energy efficient. So that kind of if you then click on fiscal year 22, you can see that that same person. Um, did more consulting work in fiscal year 22 and a lot of that was making sure that the work that was happening at the middle school was going to get to that net zero at the end of the day and the, the way to do that is to you know ensure that any energy loss is minimal and then the solar is um, function gonna function at a point where you get to net zero and some work that happened in that year too was Char Charles Niebling consultant so as that work was starting to ramp up for the elementary school, which was put on pause for a while, uh, you know, they were making sure that the town was going to have the necessary information they needed. And so they, they brought in more of an, an expert in making sure that all the stakeholders had more of the information. But again, when we found where we, where we were with the capital projects fund at the end of last year, we put that, that that's been on a pause. If you go to fiscal year 21, you can see that um, there, there was some consulting work again by DDH, all temp, and I, I think part of the all temp might be in Viking was more to coordinate to make sure that the HVAC we could control or somebody could control or have online access to again. So that was some work that they, I believe they 
they put in as a district expense. And then you have Windy Hill Associates who did a lot of work at LMS as an architect on record, as well as bringing in electrical engineers, um, but also was consulting the district as a lot, of, a lot of towns in fiscal year 21 were looking at HVAC, not you know at all of their buildings as a reaction to COVID and making sure that their quality was going to be able to keep up with, with, with COVID and then after COVID kind of keep up with anything else that might come up as well. So yeah, so as you look at any, any location, it's really kind of flipping through those, um, those years to kind of get what, what creates those amounts. So the short answer would be that anything that's, that's built to the district is when we're looking at all the schools as opposed to, you know, A&E mechanical at, ele at uh, the elementary school. Yep. Yeah, because yeah, that so, expense is specific to that building. Yeah, these but, other expenses could be district wide. Yeah, and what, what I, I mentioned Charles Niebling. It was elementary, but he was also doing PR on the middle school as well. So, um, yep. Okay. Any other questions for Doug? Yeah, hey, hey, Doug, sorry, the, the couple questions here on the expense reports, the detailed expense reports, um, I, I noted that there's seemingly a increasing negative balance in district wide grounds, and not sure why that might be. So you're going back to this current year? Uh, right, so the expense report year to date, fiscal year to date. Yeah. So, so in a lot of the specific district-wide ground services accounts, they're running a negative balance and not sure why that, why that is. Do you happen to know what page Doug's you're on? Flipping through paper. I, I know Do you have what a page number that you're looking at? Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. So this is, it's really the salaries, substitutes, travel. So it's page seven into eight. Okay, so my understanding was that when they put in the budget for that year, it was a there was it was budgeted for a full time and a part time, um, and it was they were not able to hire a part time, and the thinking was to to move that to a full time with using the combination they they had a full time a part time and a summer person, so they combined the summer person and the part-time person to be able to hire a full-time person. Um, so it, they, the, therefore there was gonna be more spent on salaries for that year. So next year we so have- is, a, that, is that money being offset off from another account then to cover it, the difference? The, the, other, the difference between it, because Doug's right, it was a part-time and it was a summer, which would have been June, July, August, I think. Um, and then we were, remember the number of custodial positions that we had vacant. So the idea was let's get somebody, because we couldn't hire, if I remember correctly, we had tried to hire a part-time, which position was vacant? It might have been the summer position that we couldn't get somebody into. Um, so that's when we combined it and said we'll use uh, cost avoidance from open custodial positions. We'll have the person full-time and then in the uh, winter, we can bring them in the building to help with custodial needs throughout. So it was a way to combine the number of open custodian positions and the open grounds positions into one full-time position. So in that helping yeah, out- so I should, there, there should still be a positive balance in another line item then to offset this, correct? It should be in the custodial salaries. Yeah, the custodial salaries- You need to do a budget transfer to cover. I mean, it's it's a bottom line budget. So I mean, if we do do the transfer at the end of the year, we won't necessarily know that we overspent in, in that line. So it's just what type of information we want at the end of the year. Okay. All right. Um, just another question: Could you speak about special education transportation and that also being negative? Yeah, so um, special ed transportation. You, you know, we have multiple vendors that we're using for that. And I think when transportation companies can go up in their rates, they have gone up in their, uh, when they can go up they in paying their salaries to their drivers, mm -hmm. uh, they have. 
um, and they don't always have they don't always work in that three year union type of contract that we do sometimes. So their wages have increased more with inflation than say sometimes when you have a three year contract with a union. Um, and so once their wages go up, and since a lot of these are, are year by year costs for us, therefore it trickles down to us paying more as well. Just the way it is. So I think is that well, shown I mean, is that shown as like just the way it is, but I mean it's it's forty forty five thousand dollars in negative at the moment, right? And there, we still have a few months to go in the school year. So that that's the expectation where it's gonna end around forty forty five thousand negative. You had asked, uh, which was good a couple of, a couple months ago about special ed transportation and I had them look into yep. it to figure out where do we see we're going uh, that we're gonna end at the end of the year and they they ran the numbers again at that time and they encumbered all their expenses. So what you see for that 45,000 or 40,000, I forget which number it is, that's their expectation of all expenses for special ed transportation. And then we start over again for summer school, for special, ed, tra yeah. special ed transportation starts when summer school starts. And these are private vendors, right? We have like six of them coming and going and yeah. yeah. All right, so that that mine is that that negative forty four thousand nine oh eight, and for for the board awareness, this is on page eight of the of that report. That's where we intend to land at the end of this financial year. That is correct. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Andrew, they can basically charge what they want because they know we're between a rock and a hard place because of legal documentation that we're responsible. I, I get it, right? And, yeah. But we need to come up with a plan to pay for it, right? Yeah. And for forty-four, almost forty-five thousand dollars in the hole in a tight year, that's that that's a hit. Yep, definitely is. Thank you. Any other questions for Doug? Financial questions? So, we just have the student transportation. If we want to talk yep. about it a little yep. bit more. Um, so as we were talking about declining enrollment, it, as we did fall budgeting, you know, the school bus was brought up uh, by multiple groups, so I think by, by this group as well as by the budget committee. We, you know, it was, it was brought up in a, in a time where I don't think we we're going to be able to get information in order to make a decision right then, but we said let's, let's get the information out at some point this year. So with working with the bus company over a couple months with them kind of taking numbers to make sure first we wouldn't overcrowd and then to kind of see how that would adjust times, they believe that it can be done without overcrowding, and then they would selectively combine buses. So they wouldn't Like they're alter, doing now, like, bus seven and bus like, one. Like, yeah, yeah, so for, for different reasons. But next year, you know, if a kid is, is on a bus that gets picked up first out of everybody in the district, that bus wouldn't be altered. If a kid is on a bus that gets dropped off last of everybody in the district, that bus wouldn't be altered. It would be the buses that, that tend to have the shorter routes, which they would then combine the kids on those. So our earliest pickup time of 6.40 a.m. for the middle school and high school and 7.40 a.m. would stay. There just might be more kids getting picked up at that time. And our later drop-off times would stay. There just would be more kids getting dropped off closer to those times. So they, they're thinking, you know, some, the kids would be more adjusted by maybe about five minutes. And again, our drop-off times are, are dependent on when they leave the building. So I know sometimes, you know, an elementary parent might say, well, my kid gets to home past 3.43. Uh, our expected drop-off time of 3.43 p.m. is when they leave the building at 3.15. So if they leave at 3.20, well, everything then gets backed up by five minutes. Because that's my neighborhood's bus is the last one dropped off, and it's usually between 3.43 and 3.50. So, yep, get out of the, the, yeah. the parking lot a little bit later. So they believe it can happen. And again, for them to say that means something because we would, at the end of the day, if we, if we chose to go that way, they would get less money. Um, it's as simple as taking the per day rate of $371.76, multiplying it by the 180 days, which gives us a savings of roughly $67,000. Um, so... Offset I got this information out in an email so we could start the dialogue. I'm not expecting a, a necessarily an answer today because, you know, again, this is something that impacts the community. 
and um, but it it is a possibility to go down by one more bus. So, I mean, my big concern about it, I mean, I have a bunch of concerns about it, but my general concern about it is right now, there doesn't seem to be enough subs when they have bus drivers that are out. So we are able to combine routes in order to get these kids home. If these buses are so crowded and we only have eight bus routes next year and a bus driver is out and they don't have a sub, how are we getting these kids home? No, I, th I think that's a, a very good point. I think at that point they would, instead of taking a bus and, and dividing it up over three buses, you divide it up over five buses type of thing. Um, and now everyone's getting, a ev lot more people impacted. are getting impacted. And we know that, especially on, on the way home, that impact can lead to things that snowball. You have a dentist appointment that you need to get to. You know, a parent needs to get to work on time, and therefore they need to drop that, get the kid home, and then drop them off someplace else, too. So I think that is a, a key thing to keep in the back of our mind, that um, you're, you're going to have more kids. If you divide up, there's more kids on the bus, and there's more buses being impacted at that point. So is next year the year to do it, or is it to kind of... And I know this will lend itself into a larger conversation, um, but what happens if there's a bus or two buses that aren't operating for a specific day, right? Like we're experiencing now and have been experiencing recently with, with one or two of the buses um, at the middle school. And now we're talking eight buses consolidating into seven or six buses for a run. Yep. Yeah, I think I, that- I don't, I don't know how that will work. It's, yeah, I mean, how, how it works is there, yeah, just be more kids on the bus and more families and more kids have, having longer routes that those afternoons and more families kind of pushing back their time when they get their kids and therefore start their after school activities. Some are, are by choice after school activities and some are mandated by time after school activities. So it, it would have more of an impact whenever that did happen. Um, and as Heidi said, you, you know, I think our bus company has done Overall, and, and I can say that historically as coming from another district, like really well with, with, with getting subs, um, especially for the last couple of years, but it's not still not easy. And, and people are still have been impacted for the last couple of weeks um, on quite a few days from their inability to get subs. That is my only concern. I'm just not seeing that getting any better um, unless there's some major shift in the economy, but those unemployment's low and those types of jobs are just not the job being a bus driver is just not what it used to be um i don't know i'm not even going to get into whether they're paid enough and what that looks like that's between the bus company and their employees but um you know i think i would be curious what their sub list looks like compared to what it was a couple of years ago are we talking they have two or three people on the list that they can call to sub when they need to? Or are we talking 10 people deep to be able to sub? I mean, that would weigh into my... I don't think it's any people deep if seven and one have been riding together. Well, they were able to somehow keep bus six in the morning. And again, I the person who drives bus six, I, I only know this because they posted publicly about it on the WhatsApp page. So I can say this, they're hoping to be back shortly, but... They were able to cover that morning route with a sub because that route's covered, but they're not able to cover the afternoon route. Seven and one. So this is six. Oh, seven and one. There aren't just subs for us either, right? Their subs are because yep. those buses are right outside my office, so I see them every day. Yeah. Um, and getting behind them when they cross the railroad tracks is a real problem. <laughs> Don't um, have your vent on. Yep. The, uh, so you know, if Nashua, I mean, because Nashua, Hudson, yeah. Litchfield all come yeah. out of that same parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I think that's a key point and remember they have a collective bargaining agreement of their own yep. they have rules they have to follow on hiring and posting routes and so forth i will tell you that um our understanding is that the litchfield routes are desired because they it's, you're not crossing railroad tracks you're not uh dealing with traffic in the same way that you might be in um, in nashua um, but you still have to follow rules and post and so forth. So it's not as simple as just getting a sub. Mm -hmm. So when you factor all of that in, uh, the bus company has been incredibly responsive, but they, they have to follow their rules also. Yes, well, I can definitely reach out to them and, and see if they'll give me a, 
an idea of their... I'm just curious. I mean, I yep. imagine they're struggling too with subs. The other piece of information I think that would be helpful is the not uh, would not result in overcrowding. Um, what are we talking about? At three to a seat? For uh, what does overcrowding mean? Um, well, the bus has a capacity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. X number of kids. Three right. To a seat. But three, three to a seat for Except a 40 for, for a longer bus ride mm -hmm. is a long time for kids. I mean, again, I, we can talk about whether it's worth saving the 66000 to do that. I just kind of want to have, I would be curious what those numbers are so we can make an informed decision in terms of um, what makes sense and what's in the best interest of the students and our, our families. Yep. Do we have a big population at LMS that get dropped off at school? At every school, we have a huge population that dro gets Day, dropped off. Yeah. We had, I made a mistake. I scheduled a meeting at 2 o'clock at LMS. I should have done about 2.15. <laughs> so when I pulled in, um, the traffic for parents was backed up to the corner. Yeah. And so I was able to find my way into the parking lot and get parked and into the meeting. But um, yes, there's a big population that are dropping off and picking up. GMS is into color coding or time. They have like three or four shifts. They have to do it in waves because in they, they two were by backed. Two. They were dangerously backed up on 3A, and yeah. so they, they had to crack down and just say, you're in the blue color group and you come in this window of time. I can tell you pre-COVID, my kids never got dropped off. That was get, yeah, got get to them the on bus, bus stop. Yeah. Post-COVID, I feel like now, oh, there's a lot more parents that just kind of got used to building that into the routine. You get a few more extra minutes in the morning. It's a little less stressful, so. No way. I like you're waiting in that line at GMS. <laughs> Well, I think what happened with COVID, too, was that more parents started working from home. Yeah. And that has somewhat continued, but it hasn't always continued for five days. So, you know, some, right. sometimes those parents are now back at the office two or three days, um, and they might be trying to still work, make drop off and pick up work out, but that might not keep lasting, you know. So eventually we might have more kids back on the, the bus. The remote thing is start, people are starting to be Cold. come back to the yeah. office and yeah. forced back to the office, yeah. too. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would just be curious what those numbers look like um, because if we have a increase in our bus numbers from parent pickup to you know to the bus, what would that look like, um, and how quickly would we be over capacity and or how long are we? I know, for example, bus nine is pretty crowded bus. There's a, that's a busy bus. It's two to a seat, sometimes three to a seat, depending on the day. I don't know that they'd be able to take many more kids, but so what's a typical bus? How long does it take? to get them home. What's the longest time of the bus? So I think well, it's my it's street. Like if, if, they if have to wait. Hour, they all can't let like, 35 minutes. 35 yeah. minutes? 35 minutes, yeah. I think the thing what that's the tough, like Natacook is the last drop off on the GMS route, but it has to go all the way up to the Manchester, turn around and then come back down in the, in the neighborhood. But it also has so to wait for St. Francis kids. That's correct. So there's the St. Francis transfer and there's nothing worse than driving by your house yep. out that window. And going all the way to Manchester the and all the way to St. Francis Turn and around back in again. Manchester in that neighborhood. That's but, what doesn't make it feel good. But my biggest concern was they're done with school at 10 minutes of 3. And they don't get on their bus till sometimes 3.15. There's, there's a lot of gaps. So they, they're waiting in for about 25 minutes to get on the bus because they do there the are three buses. parent pick up first at, at GMS. But it's also the parking lot. You can't get everyone in the circle anymore. Yeah, so it's the, the afternoon at GMS is a lengthy process because you do parent three waves of parents first, two by two, and then put children on the bus because you know you can't do both simultaneously because if a parent is there to get their kid and their kid's already on the bus, it pulled out. There's a problem. Um, and so anyway, it ends up being this lengthy orchestration in the afternoon. So I think it's a good discussion. I mm -hmm. think we're not, as you said, this is just a preliminary discussion. I would obviously put it out there for families and um, administrators and staff to weigh in. I would um, at, hope to have some of those questions if you can, mm -hmm. um, so we can talk about it in terms of what makes the most sense. Maybe I think the, the administrators next. know like when I was there. Dan knew every bus and what bus goes with what, which one's the first <coughs> one in, bus one, one and seven. Right. They're really knowledgeable of their busing. If you sent the buses first, would that make it better? Had the parents wait? So the problem is, is that if a parent 
doesn't pick up and was supposed to pick up and they don't put the kid on the bus and then the kid's left sitting there's no backup option is i think Uber one account of them. <laughs> we could we should i know most parents feel like ubers these days i mean other schools resolve that by just saying you have to notify us and it's you know there are tech tools that allow somebody to change the bus pickup right up until 15 minutes before the buses mm -hmm. and so there are other districts who deal with it that way but um, that's not something that we've implemented and honestly the um, these buses pull out of the high school I mean they start high school dismisses at 223 the buses pull out about 228 they're pretty quick at getting out of there but they need the time to do their runs and then get to GMS so mm -hmm. you know loading children around 305 is about the time the last bus is pulled in so that timing sort of works itself out Alrighty, um so we will add this to the agenda for next time to talk about you want it under old business then yes okay i think that makes sense <laughs> All right, going back to the main agenda. Any other questions for Doug before we move on? Nope. Hearing none, seeing none. All right, we'll move into public minutes. Is there a motion to approve the April 5th, 2023 minutes? I have a motion to approve the four, what? April 5th. April 5th meeting minutes. All right, and I will second that. Uh, are there any questions? on these minutes were you able to get them and i uh, yep i did get them perfect okay seeing no questions we will do a roll call vote all those in favor of approving peter uh, aye liz aye andrew aye and i'm also an aye so public minutes pass four zero zero we'll move on to new business um dress code policy uh policy committee did not meet today um so are we doing this today or should we well it, it, we're now into the dress code season so i yeah. i i think it would make sense if the board uh luckily we had a brief flavor of summer and then it became cold again so <laughs> but we should have something uh in place sooner than later mm -hmm. um and basically this just so everybody has the backstory there was a committee that met of uh school administrators to sort of talk about the concerns that the admin team had on this. And then we brought parents and students in um, and agreed to come forward with this. I mean, there's consensus around the changes that you see here. What's in green are the ads. You can see my comments and when they were added. Um, it's really a, an, a, a tweak of the existing policy rather than a whole scale rewrite. So we added that core value piece about safety because it seemed to be missing in there. Um, and really emphasizing the personal responsibility piece that um, a student who comes to school with, you know, so the question became, are those slippers or are they shoes? And we're like, they're footwear that are, you know, okay to wear in a public building. And, you but know. But it says slippers in here. They can't wear slippers. Well, so this is, this looks like the old one. Oh. It's been modified out, though. If, if I don't see any I green. don't see any more. No, I printed it out today because I'm old, but then there's no green on there. There's no green on them. There. I'm cl I click the link, and I get all the changes. So I'm wondering why that is. I don't know. What do we decide on UGG slippers? I can't sleep at night worrying about so if the, kids can wear UGG slippers. So the answer slippers. is that number three got changed to footwear must be worn at all times and yep. should be safe for the school environment, period. There have Period. on the bottom yeah Correct. flip flops and, and aren't safe the the piece that i'm and, and i apologize because i don't know why you're not seeing yeah how weird is this shoes must be worn at all times should be safe a school environment pajamas bedroom shoes or slippers shall not be worn yeah, that's, right. this language yeah. was all changed and so i i, I apologize because yeah. i'm i'm i click the link and i'm looking right at it so i don't know why it's not viewable to this information um, is linked in a tab above the Google link. And I can see you are in this document. Yeah. Anyone with the link can view, but you can't see the changes. No so changes, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm unclear on why that is. I apologize. Um, but what we were trying to do with the core value is say, if you send your kid to school with something that some people think are slippers and some people think are shoes, we don't care. You have something on your feet and that's okay. Mm -hmm. 
If there's a fire drill and a foot of snow and you're traipsing through the foot of snow to be safe, and it's not a drill, by the way. We don't have a drill in a foot of snow. It's, a, it's an evacuation. Mm -hmm. um, and your feet are cold. It's because you wore less than adequate footwear, and that's a personal responsibility piece. Yeah, that because makes sense. Because we can't be policing it all the time. Same goes with coats. If kids don't wear coats and you're outside for a fire drill for 20 minutes and they're freezing, sorry. I, I, I'm fighting that with my sixth grader now. She doesn't want to wear the coat and I'm Me. like, stuff it in your backpack and listen to me. If the fire alarm goes off, honey, grab it and go. Tell her put a sweatshirt on. <laughs> you're going to thank me later when you're outside. Yeah. I will find a way to um, to get this shared with the board. Can you do it this week? I'll just be interested. I'm, I'm oh, no, not this week. Well, it's now vacation. I feel bad because vacation. we're not... I don't think we can do a first read without everybody having seen the green I, right. changes. I completely so. agree. That's fine. But let, let me just summarize. So it's yeah. that personal responsibility mm -hmm. emphasis, right? Um, we define that clothing has to cover the entire torso, which is the way it's always read. Mm -hmm. But we said in a normal standing position because we got into this thing about, um, well, I'm okay. And then I put my arm up to write on the board and my belly up. shows. Yeah. <laughs> So we're like, look, normal standing position, and we're not looking for somebody to walk around all day like this, you know, when being asked about the dress code either. It's like, just be normal and It just can't be mid-belly. So that was a clarification that the committee recommended. The footwear piece, we're suggesting you strike all of the piece about pajamas, bedroom shoes, slippers. Just take that out. That aligns it. Pajamas? The kids can wear pajamas now? Um, the problem is defining pajamas. So there are people, I'll use Heidi's shirt, like that, fleece that material in fleece yeah. being worn, some people are saying that's pajamas, other people are saying it's... It's spirit wear for some of the teams. My son wears the soccer ones. And so pajamas aren't what they used to be. Yeah, and so we've redefined that also. Mm -hmm. um, LMS, we, we've rewritten the piece about headwear. So it now says that CHS and LMS headwear that does not cover the face or ears is permitted. They can wear hats in school? School administrators may permit any LMS headwear for religious. Why, why, why would we allow that, really? I, why would we allow them to wear pajamas, one? You know, everybody knows what, a, what pajamas are. I know you can have, like, um, and what, I go through this with 30-year-old people, too. I fought this battle with the hats last year. I, I do not, I was, that one shouldn't have been wearing a hat inside. <laughs> but during school, I'm not going to yell at Miss should... Grantham because she wore her Disney hat today. No, I'm talking about my son, the other one. <laughs> well, she can wear a hat. <laughs> I just don't think it's right they wear hats. But well, that's that it, it doesn't that put we them. Can in... Talk about the kids were pretty. I, I will say they were articulate. They were able to um, adequately represent why they thought it's it's been at CHS. That's the mm -hmm. current policy, and then, which I didn't agree with then. But can they hide their AirPods with it? No, well, that's why they, it says the ears can't be covered. Yeah, so they can't. I had a kid calling her Siri call so and so. I couldn't see it because she had long hair. I'm like, you are not doing that. No hats, boo. I, I mean, just because they can articulate, it doesn't mean that it's a good policy. That's something that the, the board can talk about. Yeah. Fidelity doesn't allow. I, I'm going to fix gonna this. I'm going to save it as a PDF, and I'm hoping that captures all of the changes. I will reshare it with the board. Um, but we'll have to do the first read May. Yep. We're going to have to do it May third, uh, and then the final approval on twenty fourth, which is late for dress code, um, but. It is what it is. You can also waive it's the second. It's more lenient. You can also waive the second read. It's up to the yeah, board on yeah. whether you do two reads. But um, again, I apologize. I thought. I thought and who, and who writes the policy? It was no hats, and I think two years ago we no, who, who who wrote it? Who created it? The policy was already written. It's been amended by the committee, the dress code committee. Agreed the dress on. Code the committee is made up of whom? I was on it for this representing the school board. All of the um, assistant principals for all three schools were on it, and there was a, at least one student and one parent from all three schools on it. And, and what we did this time, because yeah, the, the last dress code committee I think was in 2019, and that was more of a, a that was a big rewrite. There was, that was a lot Tina's of stuff that was done. Baby, yeah. Um, this time we, as much as possible, we had the same students who participated last time rejoin. Mm -hmm. And so they could talk about how it had been implemented and then mm -hmm. what further adjustments. Still did, no hoods. Hoods recommend. are bad. Hoods are, it Same very clearly hoods. says no, no hoods. hoods. Yeah. Yep. And that's enforced at the high school. Good. 
Um, okay, so you will send that around and we will address this at our May 3rd meeting. Moving on to the school board meeting calendar. I think I know the answer. I'm going to... So... Are you back? Are you I'm sorry. I know exactly where you... You moved on. I just took a look. I moved on by myself, apparently. I have to... Thanks, Emma. Bye, Emma. Bye. I have to share it with you directly to see the working draft. So all I did was I said anyone with the link can view. Um, but if I share it with you individually, then you'll be able to see the changes. So, so you share it with the I'm gonna, four of us, I'm going to do that right now. I'll share it with school board. And I'll be ready to vote on May 3rd. Here's and the one. I'm going to share it with Doug to see if my theory old tests school. out. I've always been old school. <coughs> okay. And I, again, weird, but hopefully this will take care of it. Can we go to the school board meeting calendar? May I apologize? Nope, yeah. you're good. I, I, it, it irritates me. It's like this should not be <laughs> a problem. All right, school board calendar. So my understanding is this is basically last year's calendar put into a proposal for this year. It is, um, but I want to point out a couple of changes. Yes. So look at July 23rd or July 2023. Sorry. Uh, so last year we met on the first Wednesday of the month, yeah, it which out. this year is the fifth, the day after the fourth. So we can stick with that or we can bump it back to the 12th. I don't know where it really came down to board member vacations. Away. I'm away on the 5th. So. so what date are you talking about? July 5th. July 5th, having the meeting on July. Will you do one meeting in the month of July instead of two? Mm -hmm. It's a little quieter. Um, so the last year we did the meeting on the Wednesday after, so it was the 6th, I think, last year, right? Sorry, does July 12th not work for the board? Well, that's what I'm asking. Does that work for the board? I'll be remote. Uh, yeah. It works for me as well. I think it works for me too. Okay, just give me a link. Got it. And then the you'll, next. you'll be away on the twelfth. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, August is the same, although that's a five Wednesday month. Um, so you'll notice that we're going to open school on the twenty first to the twenty fifth, mm -hmm. and then um, kids will join us on the twenty eighth through the thirty first. But we won't have a board meeting there, and we meet again on the 6th of September. I have the same, so it follows the same flow. It's basically the first and third Wednesday throughout. No adjustment in March because school vacation is actually in February. Um, April lines up, May lines up. So we're in good shape on that. And then for community forums, we put. Um, the 27th of September, the 13th of December, the 13th of March, and the 8th of May. And I'm curious what, if we need all of those. Yeah, we briefly talked about this, Liz and I did, during the agenda prep meeting. I think we should cut it down. I don't think we need four. I think, first of all, trying to do anything in December, um, it's just too crazy of a month. There's, too, there's concerts, there's all sorts of um activities going on and so um i don't think we should try to aim for december um if we do the september one the 27th i think that would be very timely for a power school um introduction um in terms of parents are particularly the kids are just getting started they're starting to get some grades put in there by the end of september um, walking parents through how to get a report, how to access certain things. We've talked about doing a power school one for a while. It'll be great at the beginning of the year. So, Make I sure think it's televised. It's timely. So, yeah. yeah. So, well, and it, with changes that that are coming, right? Exactly. It would be time very timely. Yep. So I think that twenty seventh one. I think we can do that. And then my thought would be we could do one. Really, anytime March or April, I'd be open to having that conversation um i think again may we get into we're doing the forum this year because we have fred coming um which is great but i think I, i'm worried about attendance a little bit just because may once spring sports start um and activities and um concerts and all of that stuff once spring comes we have a lot of trouble with it's nice out <laughs> um getting people to come to events so 
my thought would be to aim more towards March or April for that and keep it to two forums. So I turned off I turned off December 13th. That's back to a regular day now. Okay. I'm assuming the board's okay with Heidi's suggestion. Um, and I'll turn off May 8th and make that a regular. We can add if, if there comes, mm -hmm. yeah, if there's something comes some controversial yeah. issue that we need to address, right? We could add another, we could add another date. And while we're looking at it, I think the March 13th, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but the election is probably the 12th, right? That's the green. Yep. Trying to do a forum the same week as the election is probably not a good difficult idea. to plan. Um, and so I would probably bump that one to April would be my thought process. You well, could, would you do it before the election? You could go to April. We could do February then. But again, February gets into deliberative month. We always, for the past two years, haven't we done the two, the Monday before election or the... We usually end up, yeah, we have, we have ended up... We have to squeeze one in. We don't this year because vacation falls correctly. We'll have a regular meeting on the 6th, but... Um, I, I personally, and again, I one vote, so everyone else, please feel free to weigh in. Um, but I just think trying to do it the week of elections, you have a new person or two new people who are going to be elected in March, jumping in and literally having to jump into a new forum. So, um, what? Did I say something wrong? Yes, two new people. I said one or two. I don't okay. know what I'm doing yet. <laughs> I make no commitment past today. <laughs> um... So that's the that would be my thought process, um, and moving it to we could do the fourteenth. Obviously, we can't do it February vacation. We could do it the twenty seventh. I mean, it doesn't have to be the second. It could be the fourth. A, 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 another suggestion: we're we're so we're going from four to two. Mm -hmm. So they were sort of based on quarters before. Mm -hmm. You could look at something like January thirty first, which is a five Wednesday. Um, and yeah. kind of get ahead of, so it could be like a budget 101. I'm just tossing that out as a concept, but it yeah. doesn't have to be that. It could also be some other concept that comes along. So I would let's put it for January if that's okay with everyone. I w oops, um, sorry. I like doing it on a f when there's a five Wednesday month. Mm -hmm. Um, so you could do the 24th or the 31st, which, I think the, do you have a preference? No. Do you have a preference? It's a long way in the future. I have no yeah. idea. Yeah, <laughs> I was right? just going to say, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. Okay. All right. So <laughs> let, let me just pick the 24th. Sounds good. Um, let's see where it lands. So it's maroon. Hmm. It's that. Copy. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> it's more brown than that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Except now it's, I have to change the date to the 24th. Yep. Got it. All right. Good call on the copy, Doug. If you're good, we 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 should approve, approve this. this. It, yep. Says approved Andrew, for. do you have any questions? I don't want to ignore you over on the computer or comments. Well, I, I'm sensitive to approving it when we haven't gone through the budget calendar, right? Because I know there's a proposal on here for November 2nd and 7th, mm -hmm. which doesn't align to the budget calendar and what their expectations are. Thank you for that reminder because I, I put on here, and I forgot to raise that, the yellow are the budget committee. Um, so why don't we come back to this after we discuss the budget committee That's calendar? Fine. That is the next thing on the agenda. So um, we can do them collaboratively. We all looked at the calendar. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think the first six weeks of school, everything's up in the air. Principals are starting to get to know their students, their new staff, and to ask them to get a budget ready in the first six weeks, along with getting his st new staff and everybody up on to speed, while two of us or four of us are doing negotiations, it's a lot. 
Would you? Why don't we negotiate with the teachers in the summer? Why we do we wait till the fall? We did with the support staff the past two years. We we've, we've offered that, but um, the teachers want to wait until fall. At least in the past, they have. Yep, we can offer that again. Mm -hmm. um, but in the past, they've declined that offer and have chosen to wait until fall. We were able to meet once to set out ground rules in, ju in June in June and to come up with a schedule for the fall of dates, but we did not have any summer. And the support staff was done by August? Yeah. For the past two years, I've been on the support staff, and we were done by August. And that would make that would, and I think it does make more sense to meet more often with the budget committee because I think it, I saw in the thread that you meet meet twice with them, and that does, that's a lot of stuff in the budget to try to handle in two meetings. But they're watching us for two meetings it's our before, budget, yeah. So we have a meeting, and then they have meeting. Do you know what I mean? They come in and watch us do go through everything for two days, and then they we go in and they we report to them directly so there's actually four days five i don't know i'm just gonna keep it's my mouth shut. I, I consider it more of a preview for them to mm -hmm. be able to sit and watch us go through the budget and have our discussions mm. um a good introduction and then they're ready to jump into their discussions during their budget committee meetings the fall after those meetings um and then we present individual each school presents to them along with dr jetty for how many weeks four well, weeks. well so if, if you click the link to the proposed uh calendar from the budget committee and actually andrew you should probably be the one to present this because it you were there for the discussion on it uh, yeah happy to so the budget committee is looking at really following the same the exact same flow as they have for the past few years. Um, it's, it's no different this year with the exception of October 31st, which is Halloween, which would have fallen on a budget committee meeting night. Um, or, sorry, there, thereabouts. Yeah, it was, it was um, actually, the, if, if you remember this year, we did Tuesday joint meeting with the budget committee. That's right. That's right. Then we did yeah. Wednesday school board meeting, and then we did Thursday joint meeting. It would have been the Tuesday is the 31st. So that's a conflict, because I think people would rather be out with their kids or home um, handing candy out, so. That, right. That's right, thank, thank you for that. But um, we do have a Wednesday so, school board meeting on November 1st. On November 1st, right. Correct, and so the, the thought from the budget committee was to have the November 1st, or the idea was to, to have the, the November 1st meeting be the first joint budget review session, right? And, and use our meeting as the joint budget review session where we're going through the budgets. And then that's the first essentially view that our board would have of the budget with the budget committee listening and following along, but with also the ability to be able to ask questions. Right. If the expectation is that we're trying to streamline process and save our staff, our district staff, the the um, with the need to be able to present multiple times, the budget committee would like to review the budget, have questions available, so they can also ask our staff, as opposed to then requesting individuals come back and present to the budget committee, as was historically the process. So the alternative, and I, I noted it, I'm hoping you can see my comment on the side. Um, and if not, I, it's what yes. I laid out on the, uh, the school board meeting calendar is that, um, because I think we still need the November 1st meeting for school, regular school board business mm -hmm. to not have that available to us or to try to, because um, I think we were many hours at the fire station on budget and then to have a regular meeting on top of it would be a big ask. So what I'm suggesting is that we have our regular meeting on November 1st. We begin the budget process on November 2nd, the Thursday. We have, instead of uh, the Tuesday before, we have it the Tuesday after. So on November the uh, 7th, we would have the second session with the budget committee. And then the budget committee meets on Thursday. <coughs> so it is turned over to the budget committee on the 7th around the ninth sorry so then your proposal here is the budget committee would receive the draft 
on the 26th, which, which I, is a week before the school board would review it. it well, and the um, they would receive it at the same time the school board does. So the 26th is when we would have all the documents available. So we would have done our preliminary budget development work. Um, the documents will then become available on that Thursday. I believe last year that um, those binders were carried off to the budget committee meeting on the mm -hmm. 26th, right? So they have a regular meeting on that date. The budget documents would be delivered without comment. It would just be here they are. We'll be reviewing these starting next Thursday. Um, and you'll be able to hear all the presentations walking through from Pardon me, directors, principals, et cetera. So we would begin the process the following Thursday. But they'll be able to ask questions at this time. Um, what you've done in the past is th those questions are at the end. So they're not asking the questions throughout okay. the presentation. Our team's presenting I to the we'll board. I think we'll need more than two days then. And then the board takes it at the end. No, I just think with all the questions from us in the budget committee, don't you think we need at least two or three days historically we've done two um but they've never asked questions before really they have at the end um but, but they not as the administrators are presenting yeah so, so. i would think that you're going to lose questions if they're waiting till the end of the entire presentation if elementary school is presenting stuff and we should probably ask questions while the elementary person elementary school is there we are asking questions mm -hmm. budget committee opportunity it, historically and i'm mm -hmm. not saying this is how it has to be but the thought process has been this is the school board's review of the budget yeah. we're working collaboratively with the budget committee inviting them to come in inviting them to giving them a budget ahead of time so that they can see it and inviting them to ask questions at the end but this is our time to make adjustments, cuts, have comments, and our questions answered so that when we turn it over to the budget committee to do what it is that they choose to do with the budget, mm -hmm. it's the school board budget at that point. We have gone through it and voted on it versus uh, doing it collaboratively to the point where budget committee is jumping in during school board time to ask questions. But to Andrew's point, doesn't, doesn't, don't people have to then go Back. present again to the budget committee again so it's sort of duplicative they're going to ask those so, questions well, eventually. That, yeah that. that that's the piece that we've cut out peter so hi historically what we did i say historically i'm giving you a five-year history right so uh the school administrators developed the budget we would meet with the school board on a saturday um all day all day and we would present the budget to the school board and the board would make cuts additions, revisions, whatever the board was needed to do. Um, and then that got finalized. And then that's the budget that got passed on to the budget committee. But nobody ever attended it. It was just yeah. us on a Saturday at Campbell. With the administrators. It was a public yeah. meeting, but nobody came. Um, the whole administrative team was here on a Saturday doing this work. The board was here on a Saturday doing this work. And then we go off to the budget committee. It's like we start the process all over again. Mm -hmm. So now we represent to the budget committee and everybody's here for those sessions at night and administrators came i think two nights because they did the initial presentation and they came back the following week for questions and answers so to streamline that process and that time on our staff um, we proposed look when we're presenting it to the school board let's have the budget committee sort of come and observe they'll have a chance at the end to ask clarifying questions but they're kind of seeing the sausage be made and they're hearing the questions the board is asking they have a chance to ask clarifying questions of them when it gets turned over to the budget committee it's doug and i sitting there and what we did is developed a google form where um, the board the budget committee was able to ask questions and we share those with our team so they're answering the questions in real time or um, answering the questions so that they have the answers in front of them but it just minimizes all the nights out and all of the process. I so. think the fact we're giving them it to them a week early should help, don't you think, Andrew? Well, it sounds like it's the I same think, time. Well, I, I think the proposal is reasonable. I think it should be presented to the budget committee. I think the ask was they want at least a week uh, to be able to review and prepare for the joint budget sessions. Mm -hmm. So even with the proposal of 
October 26th, and then having our first meeting on November 2nd, that, that provides the budget committee a week to review the budgets mm -hmm. and be prepared to ask questions of the administration if, if they so choose. Because can't we just do like Peter said, GMS presents, then we ask questions and then the budget committee. I would be open to that. I, I don't have any problem with that. I but I don't know that we should combine the questions necessarily, but I or they can take notes and then send a spreadsheet. If, no, yeah, I mean, I don't I, know. If we, they, their questions may require a detailed answer, and it's good to have the person who is most knowledgeable familiar, yeah. Yeah, to answer it. So I, I don't. And if I reflect back on the on the on the on the budget committee members that joined at the fire station last November, that that was really exactly the flow. I mean, yeah, yeah they also had questions at the end, but if if uh, Mr. Mitchell was presenting uh, the GMS budget and there were budget committee questions of the GMS budget, they, they did ask. Yeah, good. All right, so really the only change that's being proposed is the addition of the keeping November 1st as our regular school board meeting and then the addition of the November 7th, that Tuesday, um, for a second uh, joint session with the budget committee. And also- And then on the budget the 26th for the budget for the estimated delivery of the right. budget to the budget committee correct i think that should meet everyone's needs and i guess my question doug is that reasonable like you're the one who has to prepare it and get it all ready to go and yeah we did the 26th this year I think. we did yeah yeah so i think going before the 26th is is less about me and more about the administration I already be an sb2 town we have to get our budget ready before a lot of the other towns do mm -hmm. in, in New Hampshire. So I came from a, a not SB2 town. I was an admin there. And we already felt pressure getting it ready. So I could imagine just becoming an SB2 town as a school administrator, welcoming the kids, getting to know your new staff, getting the flow of the year. And then we bombard them right off the bat with, with budget too. So I think that the 26 is pretty much the earliest we're probably ever going to get it done. Um, you know, I always try to be flexible, but I, I don't see getting it done before the 26th in a way that admin can still be admin, can still be thoughtful about the budget and, yeah. and get it to a point. Yep. So sounds reasonable to me. I think Mr. Plansky, uh, if you're intending to, to go to the budget committee meeting tomorrow, um, I think it's just a matter of running through the, the proposal and the schedule with them. Okay, just to propose changes. Okay, I'm gonna be there. <laughs> All right, so do we want to vote on this as a school board? In so, sounds reasonable to me. Well, I, I think we vote on our school board calendar. We did, yeah. So I, we can go back to voting on that. Um, I don't have an issue voting for both if we need to separate it out, if there's a reason to separate it out, but if people are comfortable well, I, voting I on it. I don't know why we would vote on a budget committee calendar if it's not our calendar. I think we vote on our school board calendar, which has inputs into the budget committee calendar. I think what we, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I think we have control and we have decision making as it comes to when the school board meets. And so we're proposing these joint sessions and we want to work with the budget committee to do that um so I, I i guess what i'm saying approving the budget committee schedule as it relates to us and our meetings yeah obviously they're free to do and meet whenever they want <laughs> i'm not trying to govern their schedule in any way um but you're right i think we can accomplish that by by just voting on the school board meeting calendar so then i would i would yep. just point out that the yellow dates are what we just talked about right so the proposed changes so if you're voting on this it's adopting those changes so the 31st is Halloween we're not touching it budget committee joint sessions on the second and the seventh and then it's budget committee until they're done I will make a motion to approve the 2023-2024 school board meeting calendar is there a second second any other questions or comments from any board members Hearing and seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye or nay. So, Peter? Aye. Liz? Aye. Andrew? Yes, aye. And I'm an aye as well. So that passes 4-0-0.
Okay, moving along to general assurances. So general assurances. Um, this is an annual thing that we are asked to approve. The general assurances are tied back to the grant money that we receive. Um, and the document now needs to be signed by, I guess in the past, it was always signed by the school superintendent. Um, but they've asked that the board chair also initial all the pages. Um, and the reason is that, you know, it does bind the district to uh, things that we need to do. Most of those reside in federal law. Um, and so these are now due to the Department of Ed no later than May 5th. So we can uh, choose to vote on those tonight. You could choose to vote on those on May 3rd. Um, but in order to have grant money available to us, we need to have the, the executed copy up to the department by May the 5th, that Friday. So it's really the pleasure of the board. And if, if you have questions about the general assurances, I'll try to answer those. Are there any questions? No, not from me. So I, I looked through this and then went back to last year's general assurances just to see if there were any um, striking differences. I didn't see any. They seem pretty run-of-the-mill standard legal language <laughs> lingo and, and it ties back to the federal law so unless right. there's a, a, a major rewrite in federal law you shouldn't see any major differences how do folks feel about approving these tonight did everyone have a chance to look at them yes i did uh, i don't have a problem with voting on it tonight Andrew, is it okay with you to vote tonight? Yes. Okay. Um, again, since I'll be the one signing, but I would only be doing so on behalf of the school board, I would want to make sure everyone is comfortable with this. So um, I'll make a motion to, um, I guess, approve and sign the and authorize the board chair to sign the general assurances for FY 2024. Is there a second? Second by Ms. McDonald. Questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Um, all in favor? Peter? Aye. Liz? Aye. Andrew? Aye. And I'm also an I. Four zero zero. Four zero zero. Do you have that here? I do not have that here. Okay. So we will have to print off the twenty some odd pages and. <laughs> okay. We'll and I will come. Bring by. a good pen. I will. I'll get my blue one. I'm good to go. Plenty of time. But we'll get it done. <laughs> yeah. No. But I would rather not have to rush it up on the fourth. I'm sure you yeah. guys would prefer not to rush it up on the fourth too. Right. Um, yeah, moving fourth on to you. job description, social worker and exe executive assistant to the superintendent. Yep, so we have two. You can see the social worker job description is actually rather dated. Um, it is, uh, goes all the way back to 2005, so it, it was in need of revision. Um, the key changes are in red. One thing I want to point out is that originally we had a, a district social worker. We had one for the district. So. The direct report was to the director of special services. Over time, with grant money, um, we've expanded so that we now have three social workers, one in each, pardon me, one in each school. Um, and so we want the social worker to report to the school administrator, the person that they're in the building for, um, but also having the director of special services um, be uh, providing oversight and support because that is part of the support network. So um, you'll notice the report to we're adding school administrator. And then we've also uh, made some adjustments to the language based on feedback um, for the position. So I don't have access to this document. The social worker? Yeah. Yeah, mine's not opening this time either, but I was able to look I at it early. I was able to look at it today. What is going on? I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> show off yeah. I, I was able to look at it I just looked at it a couple minutes ago just to double check it says access denied drive I do not know what the Google is doing tonight it says Heidi follow. you're the owner I own it, That's what it Heidi. Says. Uh, you when I click on it I think Heidi Holly is the up. owner oh Holly might be okay yeah, that's what I'm oh, showing I don't think I own it Yes, Holly is the owner. I have it. I just Would updated like it, it, so you, I'm seeing you pop in now. If you try again, I don't know 
What happened? Yep, I got it now. Heidi, Mike. But Pete. I was able to review it earlier just, in the week. That's so. just so weird. I, there it yeah, is. I don't know why. I do like the change of having them report to the building principal. I think mm -hmm. that's important for communication and collaboration amongst the team. Um, how do the building principals feel about that? Um, I think they appreciate that because that person is a key member of their team. They're, mm -hmm. they're working in concert with their counselor, their school counselor, um, and they're really, you know, they're handling, if you look at major things that are being assigned to them, um, we have truancy, for example. Like, okay, a child's been truant, what's going on? The social worker needs to leverage community resources, help support the family. Um, but that's a student in the building and it's a truancy matter that the admin team and the counselor are aware of. So everybody's kind of pulling in the same direction if we get this aligned by having the, um, the school administrator be the direct report. Any questions? No. Comments? Do we want to do, do these separately or are folks okay doing them jointly? Let me just do a quick overview. So if you remember, we had two positions in the office. Um, Barbara, Barbara's title was assistant to the superintendent and Michelle's title was executive assistant to the superintendent um, or executive administrative assistant to the superintendent. So um, now we have collapsed that into one position and Barbara has announced her retirement. So we are realigning the job responsibilities. So. This is essentially um, Barbara's job description rewritten. And you can see uh, the changes in red. So it will be one position, executive assistant to the superintendent. We've taken things off the plate that Barbara had historically done, and we've clarified um, some of the other tasks. So uh, this ends up being the, the proposed rewrite for that job description. Can you open it? Yes, you're all in it. Good. Mm -hmm. yep. Any questions on this? No. I guess my only question is more of a generic question, which is how is it going combining the positions and or are you still comfortable? I mean, we obviously have a budget for next year where we don't have one of the positions, so our hands are tied. Um, are things <coughs> has it been difficult to get things done i feel like you're doing more okay so it it definitely has presented um challenges with the transition um part of it is barbara's been with the school district over 30 years sure. and so this is a shift in what we're asking her to do mm. on the doorstep of retirement yeah, right yeah. so that has it's been a big change yeah a, a big change for her um she's a trooper she's willing to take it on and to try to figure it out um, I think that bringing somebody new into it and training up on what the job responsibilities are will um, result in uh, being able to get this stuff done. Um, there are some things that she has historically done. So if you look under human resources, you see three strikeouts um, because Holly and um, Lisa, who is the payroll person, are going to take on that responsibility. So. Um, you know, we're sort of shuffling some things off as we assign some other tasks. So I think in the end, we're going to end up being okay. Um, but it's been stressful. There's no I doubt. I see three strikeouts. I don't see any strikeouts. Yeah, that's, see that's why I was kind of confused because no mine, mine shows very little change. I'm like, this is all you changed. Oh, my <laughs> word. Can I, can I just show you? I clicked the same link and look at what I'm looking at. Oh. I'm not making this up. We see a couple words in red and one line struck. I, I, I don't see any of your comments either. I don't know what to say because <laughs> this is what I thought I was presenting to you and um, this has never happened before yeah, I've see, never had this, this is before. this is what we're seeing like very little so I don't changes. understand why you see some changes and not all that's so bizarre I'm not seeing any changes there's some red at the top right, right at the top oh yeah executive yeah. Yeah, just, so just in the very, in then the very first table through, but like even a having ten your weekly comments on meetings. the side would have been helpful if we can could I, see them can I ask you to do something yeah underneath the share button you have a word no, you have it as read only, right? Never mind. No, nope, I can't ask you to do this. I, again, I think the, the lesson is we need to save this as a PDF so that you see everything. 
you're you're just not seeing the edits that we're proposing, and that's frustrating. Yeah. But I see but them saw for them the, the social worker. You saw them. Mm -hmm. I did see them, and I see them now. What? The Unless heck? it's something different than what you're seeing, which I I, I, I see a whole bunch for the social worker too. Right. So, we're following the same process with both. We're editing and suggesting, and. Um, so for tonight's purposes, I would say I am comfortable approving the edits to the social worker. I think I would want another wait yep. till the May meeting to do the executive assistant. And if you could circulate and make sure we, we are seeing what you see, um, that would be good. Um, so I will make a motion. Does everyone agree with that? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the job description for the social worker. Is there a second? A second. All right. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we will do a roll call vote. Peter? Aye. Liz? Aye. Andrew? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Um, and we will postpone and table the executive assistant to. Oh, the one piece that um, I'm, I'm worried about losing time on posting mm -hmm. that position, so I'm probably going to go ahead and post it because I think the board. We, we all agree that we're combining into the one. We're going to do some adjustments to it. We can always get the job description available to the successful candidate after the May, what are we looking at, May 3rd meeting. Yep. Um, but I, I got to get this thing posted because otherwise we're going to lose potential candidates. And July 1st will be here before we know it. So, yep. um, so we'll go ahead and get that posting out. All right, sounds good. Again, apologize. I'm going to get, I need Google help apparently because. <laughs> All right, we're heading back to old business. Uh, follow up on the community forum regarding grading and reporting. So it's the same link as you had last time. Uh, Mary proposed changes. Um, she's put some updates that I think you see highlighted in yellow. So mm -hmm. there was a, a perk review of social studies has begun. Work to come on that. Um, further down, you can see there was a grading and reporting committee meeting yesterday there was and yeah. so she updated that that occurred and if so. you look at that report I just will highlight it um, the proposal was for formatives to count for 15% the feeling was 10% was not enough and 20% was too much and the compromise for a proposal again it's not approved we have to mm -hmm. you know have that conversation but that's where it is right now what's the cheaper teacher representation on that board there's good representation. And parents? Any um, parents? No. Yes. Well, me. I mean, yeah. and Tina. And there are some of the teachers on there are parents actually in the district. Right, but are we going to, and I think I asked Mary this when she was here the last time, are we going to get parents involved in this process or are we just going to present it to the parents at the end and I hope think everybody's happy? Which That I can't answer. Mike, I don't know if you can answer that. I, I think the intent is to follow that outline. We're broadcasting it publicly. We're sharing it. When we get ready to make the proposal, um, it'll be left out in the public, so parent would have the parents would have the opportunity to come forward to the board if they are concerned. So, um, they they definitely will know what we're proposing for the start of next year mm -hmm. before it's voted on by the board. So I'm assuming this was a compromise on both parts. Yeah, it was, and it was a good discussion. Having sat in on the grading and reporting, and Tina was there as well. I think there was. You know, it, it's a philosophy change for some teachers who are um, very, um, uh, that are, I don't want to say strict because that's not the right word, but really conform to the competency based model. Um, and then it's, you know, a jump for some of the other folks. So I, I think this was the compromise. Um, but again, we'll see what the recommendations end up being that come to the board on the 7th. Um, but there, you know, it was a good conversation. I guess I would recommend that when if that's the way we want to go, that if we do almost like another form like we did in the library and have the parents in before something is presented as final. Because I th that meeting was, I think, very clear that they wanted change, substantive change. Um, not just to the grading, but to this other stuff, the retake policy and late work and all that sort of stuff. And it to be enforced yep. cons consistently across the board. Discussion of 
I think it'll be um, up to the board to decide whether you want to do an, another form like that or if you want to have almost like a public hearing at a regular meeting. Mm -hmm. That would be, I here. would be fine with that. Something that's advertised yep. goes yep. out and, yep. and we have a full room as opposed to. All of our friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a forum. The cricket. Yeah. <laughs> a less than full room. <laughs> All right. I, I agree. I think we need to get families involved. They obviously, this is passionate for a lot of families. Um, anything else on the community forum follow-up? Any other questions? Not at the moment. All right, seeing none, we'll move on to school board comments. Any school board comments? start um, I want to say congratulations to the CHS um, Friends of Performing Arts for putting on a fabulous play um, I laughed I didn't cry but it was it was wonderful <laughs> it was really good it was oh, funny awesome. um, they, the kids were amazing I mean they're not really kids they're young adults now but just really really good um, and my 12 year old liked it too so um, congratulations to them Congratulations. There's so much going on. There's a on. play at LMS tonight. There is. I thought it was tomorrow I thought night. it was tomorrow. Is it it's, tonight? Yeah, Martha was there. Oh, I'm going tomorrow night. Okay. I can't keep track. I mean, there's so many yeah. events going on. So there is an LMS play. Yep. And then, um, yeah, so good luck to everyone who is participating in sports. There's just, there is just so much going on. I heard the lacrosse game from my house today. I'm like, yeah. It's not football season. I can only typically hear football. <laughs> Play on the same field. It's not pretty. Yeah. <laughs> I drove by, and it was definitely looked like there was a crowd, which is good. The lacrosse team has more kids on it than the football team. Really? It's a fun sport. Lacrosse has taken over Litchfield. Well, in, at LMS today, there were, I think, 37 boys on the lacrosse team. I mean, they just have a huge, wow. huge yeah. group down there. So remember, the parents came and asked for that. Yeah. Yep. And they added and there's still kids playing baseball yeah. yeah as long as it doesn't take away from other things that's awesome i'm trying i'm trying to remember lots going on there's, for seniors yeah everyone be safe for april vacation um i think that's <laughs> I, I i'm my brain's done for tonight <laughs> andrew any school board comments from you i don't want to ignore you nope all good thank you all right uh, moving on to the manifest, um, I think. I looked at two of these. I went through. Two the, of them have three. Yeah, these this is the a... manifest, the last one we got today, Andrew. It's huge. I went through to see all the miscellaneous and supplies, and it's a lot. These ones have three signatures. Was this the credit card manifest? Yes. Yeah. I went through at least half of it. I just see it's it looks like a lot of sporting things are ordered a lot of like memo big sticky notes for next year or orders this is when they had the cutoff to order all their supplies for next year i believe so yeah so end of april yeah um this was the one that was circulated march. today yes. yeah right? end of march okay. was it was a cutoff yep. uh, but they get all their requests into um the, the assistants who, who then buy it so yeah. they were giving extra time to then purchase yeah. stuff so again, most of the supplies, well, it's pretty much all supplies. It's should art be supplies, for this it's gym students. supplies, it's yeah. So for the manifest, and again, I've I've told Peter what he's comfortable signing, he can sign, and then Tina and Andrew, if you're in town, can add the third signature too. I would you be? It took me a couple of a good month to feel comfortable signing the manifest yeah. um, so this one here is a little big for me <laughs> i went through at least half of it we spend more money at amazon than my wife does <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of supporting documents in that one but yeah. like the art stuff uh, the only the only question i had about specifically the credit card manifest that was circulated uh is regarding new higher expenses i'm not sure why we're putting new higher expenses on credit cards what is that for was that this is this is on page 10. I mean, there's smaller dollar amounts, uh, 369, 137, there's a $20 one, but it just, like, why? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if they're being purchased by, I don't know if it's going through Amazon. I mean, that's a lot of times where people are purchasing things and then you connect but with for the new hire expenses. The new hires, like, what do they need? What if, yeah, I don't know. Does it cut fingerprints? 
Now they pay background for checks. Now they pay for that. New hires pay for that. That's what I'm saying. What's, yeah. what's different between a new so hire? I don't know if they're if it's folders, you know, to put their paperwork in. I don't know if it's things like sharpies and, and uh, those jumbo clips. I, I'm not quite sure what they ended up buying that for that. So. That and supplies, right? So. Yeah, I suppose. I don't get any supplies. I don't, I'd have to look at a little bit more what they bought. So at this point, anyway, that, that's that's the only thing that uh, that, that I really saw. I mean, it, it's hard to decipher what all this is, quite frankly, because there's a thousand rows of supplies. I know, and there's a thousand pieces one. of paper explaining what each of those numbers is. <laughs> yeah. So Peter has signed four out of five of them. We will have Tina or Andrew, if you're around uh, Thursday or Friday, to sign the credit card one. Is that okay? Yeah. Yep. Oh, here's one more. I just got a truck. You need a rolly cart. Um, <laughs> have one. Yeah. I'm going to open it up to community input. You can get a shot of our audience, which is nobody. Um, I'm going to close community input. Um, and so with that, we will move into a non-public session. I'm going to read this, and then I'll request um, a motion to go into non-public um, for the dismissal, promotion, or compensation of any public employee or the disciplining of such employee or the investigation of any charges against him unless the employee affected, one, has a right to a meeting, and two, request that that meeting be open, in which case the request shall be granted. B, the hiring of any person as a public employee. C, matters which, if discussed in public, would likely adversely affect the reputation of any person other than a member of the body or agency itself, unless such person requests an open meeting. Is there a motion to go into non-public? So moved. Sorry, it didn't And I'll well. second. <laughs> it was like a whisper. It was, yeah, um, I'll do a roll call vote. Peter? Aye. Liz? Aye. Andrew? I'm an aye, but just a point of clarification, are we covering all three parts of the non-public session, A, B, and C? Um, we're covering A. We're covering B, and we are covering C, so yes. Thank you, I wasn't clear on B, thank you. Yep, all right, and then uh, we'll move in. You said an I, and I'm an I, so we are now moving into non-public. Thank you, everyone. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, May 3rd. Um, I hope everyone has a safe April vacation, and um, Good luck, teachers, for the next few days with the Friday before April vacation. <laughs> uh, wish you a lot of luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> may, the, may the force be with you. Thank um, you. So. Have a good night. Thanks.